All right, let's see, starting the recording. Um, this is Mike Wilkes, and this is week six of Information Systems Security and Management. And uh, oh, what an interesting week it's been uh, with the Microsoft attack uh, from hundreds of thousands of companies and uh, organizations around the world. Um, so this week's topic is a great um, coincidence, I guess, because uh, we're talking about vulnerability management. So let me just make sure I have the audio good here. It's like microphone's got good level recordings on. Uh, so let me start the share. And let's take this up to the title slide. Go into present mode, pull up my notes. Wonder why it always takes two clicks to pull up the notes, sometimes three. But anyway, all right. I resize it to make it fit. All right then. So um, let's go begin. So week six, vulnerability management. Uh, we now turn our attention to trying to make sure that incidents don't happen. What can we do to avoid being pulled from our sleep in the middle of the night? Batten the hatches, shields up, and be vigilant. New security vulnerabilities are reported every day. Zero-day vulnerabilities need to be patched or otherwise mitigated as quickly as an organization is able. A remediation matrix is normally created that outlines how quickly a severity five vulnerability on a scale of one to five, where five is critical or urgent, uh, needs to be addressed by the team. This becomes a measurable KPI, a uh, key performance indicator, for the SLA, the service level agreement, for the security program. An entire course could be taught on this subject alone, but for the moment, we'll tackle the basics and get into some of the issues which plague InfoSec teams around the world. How to manage thousands of security vulnerabilities, many of which have active exploits being directed at your infrastructure and end users every minute of every hour of every day. Uh, and that's certainly the case for anyone running an on-prem Microsoft Exchange server right now. Uh, there were four zero-day vulnerabilities that were announced uh, earlier. Um, I think it was maybe on March 2nd, and uh, it's now March 6th. So if you haven't patched, uh, you've probably already been compromised. And the bad guys have been putting in uh, web shells and remote access um, tools uh, with the breach. And it's believed to be a, a Chinese um, advanced persistent threat that has been codenamed Hafnium, uh, which is an element, I guess, on the periodic table uh, by Microsoft. Uh, but we'll get more into that uh, a little bit later on in some of the following slides. So let me start with the phrase batten down the hatches. Uh, this is not really the right approach because it implies that there's a period of smooth sailing when the hatches are not battened down. And so uh, I think that's certainly you know, become quite evident in the last couple of uh, months uh, with uh, supply chain attacks and vulnerabilities uh, being exposed and lots of uh, companies having to declare uh, breach events. So let's uh, examine that phrase for a minute. It's an old maritime phrase that sailors used to prepare for stormy weather. Battens are long wooden sticks used to temporarily attach canvas to a ship's hatches to make the ship more watertight and be able to weather the storm. To close the hatches or hatchways, which were round or square openings, as in the photo I have here, uh, openings in the deck to get the cargo uh, in and out of the lower quarters of the ship. The thing is, the storm doesn't seem to come and go anymore. It's pretty much always there in cyberspace. So what's the word vulnerable mean? If we're gonna talk about vulnerabilities, let's uh, define the term or at least seek a definition. Vulnerable, according to uh, dictionaries that I looked at, can be defined as being capable of being physically or emotionally wounded, open to attack or damage, assailable, and of course, vulnerable to criticism. Open to attack, just like the baby sea turtles shown here that have just hatched and are headed to the ocean. A computer vulnerability is a cybersecurity term that refers to a defect in a system that can leave it open to attack. The vulnerability could also refer to any type of weakness present in the computer itself, in a set of procedures, 
or in anything that allows information security to be exposed to a threat. Common vulnerabilities. <coughs> um, this is a list, it's not exhaustive, but it's uh, pretty long. Um, common vulnerabilities include bugs, uh, weak passwords, software that's already infected with a virus, uh, such as these supply chain attacks that we'll talk about later, um, applications that are missing data encryption, uh, OS command injection, SQL injection, buffer overflows, missing authorization, uh, use of broken algorithms or weak protocols and ciphers, uh, URL redirection to untrusted sites, path traversal, missing authentication for critical functions, unrestricted upload of dangerous file types, dependence on untrusted inputs in a security decision, like accepting input from a client uh, in a web form on a website uh, and not sanitizing it. Uh, also cross-site scripting and forgery, uh, download of codes uh, without integrity checks. There's all sorts of uh, common vulnerabilities that uh, can be used to classify um, what's uh, available and uh, what your exposure is. Vulnerability management is a tough nut to crack though. Most, if not all organizations, lack the resources to patch every vulnerability in a reasonable amount of time. Otherwise, there'd be very little uh, fallout from vulnerabilities if people could patch quickly. And if you look at it from a risk-based perspective, they might not actually want to or have to patch all of the vulnerabilities. Uh, there's actually only a small subset of published CVEs uh, that are exploited. Um, what is it? Um, uh, yeah, organizations need to prioritize patching these vulnerabilities first. CVEs with known exploit code in the wild or with strong indicators that exploit code will soon be created for the vulnerability. So here I've refreshed my graph uh, since the last time uh, that I taught this class. And uh, what you see here is a chart showing the distribution of CVSS vulnerabilities by severity over time. Uh, so what the heck happened in 2017, you might ask, looking at this graph. Uh, most software and more kinds, no, sorry, there was more software and more kinds of vulnerabilities uh, in, two, in 2017. And also perhaps uh, it was influenced um, the rise in, in CVEs and CVSS uh, vulnerabilities being uh, assigned. It, it could have been influenced by a rise in the start of bug bounty programs. So the more people that are looking for bugs, the more they will find them. Uh, and the other thing that's interesting to note is I was looking at the uh, NIST.gov uh, website, uh, which is where this graph comes from, uh, the National Vulnerability Database. There was also a backlog beginning in 2016 in actually assigning the CVEs and issuing reports uh, due to a lack of staffing. And so uh, well, that's sort of um, an artifact that you can see that was created uh, by the, uh, um, sorry, uh, that was created by uh, the lack of staffing. And so that's sort of why the graph isn't terribly smooth uh, going 20, what, 15, 2016 into 2017. Um, there's a link to the source for this in the slide notes uh, if you'd like to take a look at it later when you have access to the slides. Uh, and here's another chart. This one's a new one. They didn't have this last year. Uh, there's a chart showing the vulnerability types and how they change over time. So the vulnerabilities in the NVD are assigned what's called a CWE, um, a common, what, uh, I guess, what web environment um, based on a slice of the total CWE dictionary. So for example, CWE 79 uh, deals with improper neutralization of input during web page generation. Um, could be considered cross-site scripting falls in that category. And uh, CWE 125 uh, is the vulnerabilities that are related to out-of-bounds reads. So for example, if you have a process that allows you to read outside of its memory space, it can compromise information that it shouldn't have access to, such as other user space or even kernel space. Uh, so anyway, this sort of shows that it's not always the same uh, vulnerabilities every year. Uh, it's a bit of a mixture uh, that changes and, and ebbs and flows over time. So what's an exploit? Uh, exploits is the capability to make use of a vulnerability or a combination thereof to breach security controls and permissions. So an exploit is a piece of software that takes advantage of a vulnerability in an automated manner. Shown here, oh wait, why didn't it take it? Oh, there we go, that's odd. Um, anyway, uh, shown here is a visualization of the dark web from 
hyperiongray.com and uh, they had a blog entry. This is a, a visualization of the dark web uh, based on around 6,600 uh, websites that are running on Tor's onion services. And so if you were to go to this page, you could actually drill down to each one of these screens and uh, see what the homepage is for that uh, dark web site. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's interesting, you know, I love it when people take uh, on a big challenge, like trying to visualize, um, you know, 6,000 websites running in the dark web. I imagine there's many more and this image one can presume uh, is, is flowing and changing, you know, every day potentially. Uh, where sites are brought up and taken down on the dark web. And I even remember drilling down into some of these and, and finding something like, um, what was it, like a bonsai tree um, enthusiasts website. And so you can almost imagine it being like a 19, well, when was prohibition, 1930s? Um, a 1930s uh, speakeasy where you had to sort of know the secret code to knock on the door to be allowed in uh, to order uh, alcohol. And so in this case, um, some of these dark websites even though they're on the dark web, uh, they may not want to be advertising, you know, that you can buy, you know, um, I don't know, what are the things that people go to the dark web for? Um, drugs, guns, um, hire a hitman, you know, buy credentials, you know, things like that. So they may not put that on the front door of these websites. They may have a special site with like a hidden form or something, you know, that you have to look inside the, the page code, you know, to know what to do or an Easter egg where you have to type something in order to get through it. Uh, just to try to keep out, you know, law enforcement and threat intelligence researchers and things like that. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, the nature of exploits. Um, participants in the business of exploits, and uh, don't be, uh, you know, um, what uh, disav disabuse? No, I want to disavow you of the belief that it's not a business. It is a business for many bad actors. Anyway, so we have the security researcher. researcher uh, we have the exploit developer, uh, then we have a vulnerability broker, then intelligence services, uh, and you also have hackers, crackers, and of course, organized crime. So they're all interested in uh, different exploits, uh, which take advantage of, of specific vulnerabilities that are either known or, or unknown, depending on, you know, whether the person has uh, disclosed the information, uh, who found it, or if they're going to wait and use it like they do with a zero day attack. In the last 20 years, Attacks on computer systems have assumed a level of professionalism that is astonishing. As well as technical developments, this has also led to enormous economic growth for the you know, um, you know, uh, business of, of exploits. Stolen data and compromised systems are traded in various markets, as a result of which trade in exploits is big business now. Uh, so there's a particular link I had in here, I believe, um, from uh, skip.ch. Um, referring to uh, more information about the, the business of exploits and the development of them and the commercialization of an exploit for a vulnerability. So yes, exploits for sale, putting things on the market. So basically an idea leads to the identification of a vulnerability. Let's say you think um, well, being an idea that led to um, a particular vulnerability. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, there was one recently that I was thinking of. Um, well, anyway, uh, we can go back to the reference uh, to um, uh, Spectre and Meltdown, for example, that we talked about previously. Um, if you have this idea that you could potentially abuse speculative execution on a chip uh, to uh, find a vulnerability in the information system. Uh, that's what the idea is, that you have this uh, sort of instinct or uh, you're going fishing for, you know, possibly, um, you know, some area that might yield some, some return for your, your attention. Uh, so basically, the idea leads to finding a, a vulnerability that you, know, you could potentially exploit, which leads to the creation of a proof of concept. After the proof of concept has been reached, uh, it, it is then weaponized, essentially, into an exploit uh, and uh, the exploit is developed, which will finally lead to an attack. And uh, of course, the dark web is not really anything that special. It is a little dangerous to visit it if you don't have some protections in place. And it's constantly changing and morphing, as I mentioned. Uh, an innocuous pet rock website might be the front for hiring you know, hitmen, uh, buying email addresses, credit cards, selling drugs and weapons. 
Um, and so here, I think I found an image that uh, was also um, somebody's attempt at a visualization of the dark web and, and different connections between it. Um, but uh, I don't have the credit as to where I got that particular uh, visualization from. But uh, let's move on to uh, zero day vulnerabilities. So this one's uh, certainly uh, ruining a lot of people's weekends right now, um, exchange administrators, people that run Microsoft Exchange on-prem. Uh, for some reason, it's not uh, been considered a vulnerability for Office 365, the people that have um, hosted Exchange with Microsoft. And most likely the reason for that is because they patched all of the vulnerabilities on their Exchange servers uh, as a service uh, prior to launching uh, the release of the CVEs and the, uh, um, uh, what is it, the, the Security Center um, blog post uh, about uh, the patches for the vulnerabilities. So a zero day vulnerability is a flaw known to the software vendor, but which doesn't have a patch in place to fix the flaw. So the zero dayness of these four vulnerabilities um, was very short lived because Microsoft published, you know, what's called an out of band um, patching cycle. Typically Microsoft's updates and releases and security patches are done on what's called patch Tuesdays. And we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but uh, they did an out-of-band patch uh, release for these, and everyone needs to kind of jump on them as quickly as possible. Uh, I think there was a period between, I want to say, February 26th and March 3rd, uh, where everyone was vulnerable. And so if they released the no announcement on the 2nd of March, people couldn't have patched until March 3rd. Uh, so that's what, uh, you know, four or five days of, of zero dayness. It's no longer a zero day because there is a patch available, um, but the zero dayness is when there's nothing to mitigate it, or at least nothing from the vendor that makes the software. You can always find uh, additional mitigation techniques, like putting a load balancer in front of your Exchange server, uh, which has certain built-in, um, you know, dependencies against cross-site scripting, um, server-side uh, forgery requests, which is one of the vulnerabilities that was in the four uh, that Microsoft um, uh, uh, announced uh, and released updates for. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> a zero day vulnerability is a software security flaw known to the vendor, but doesn't have a patch yet. That's what I said. Um, the fewer the days since the zero day, uh, the higher the chance that no fix or mitigation has been developed. Even after a fix is developed, the fewer days since day zero, the higher is the probability that an attack against the afflicted software will be successful, which is why I think we've seen numbers of maybe 30,000 um, companies in the US and hundreds of thousands of companies all over the world um, affected by the uh, uh, Hafnium uh, attack. So let's dive into that a little bit. Um, the Chinese Hafnium APT is attacking on-prem Microsoft Exchange servers using four zero-day vulns. Each one has a vulnerability, a CVE assigned. So 2021 is the year. Uh, then 26855. I believe that one um, is, is fairly easy to detect. Um, and uh, there's a uh, Nmap script now that I found um, that will actually help you uh, discern whether or not uh, you are vulnerable by pointing it at your Exchange instance. Uh, CVE 2021, uh, 26857, uh, 26858, and 27065. Uh, so as I mentioned, there's over 100,000 breaches and growing with at least 30,000 in the U.S. according to first reports. Uh, Volexity, uh, V-O-L-E-X-I-T-Y dot com, they have a good write-up of the attack uh, as they broke the story first in their blog. And uh, what I can do is I think I can copy that link address and uh, throw it into the chat for you so that you have it available. There we go. And uh, it's also in the lecture notes, of course, uh, slide notes uh, when you look at them later. All right, uh, so what's happening? Um, well, basically after they use these vulnerabilities to uh, write files into the file system of the Exchange server uh, through its API and through its uh, Outlook web access interface, uh, web shells are being injected into the II, into the Internet Information Services, the web servers, instances of OWA, Outlook Web Access, and corresponding services for Microsoft Exchange. And oddly, I think, as I mentioned, the O365 hosted instances are not deemed vulnerable. Uh, you could think of this potentially as Microsoft's way of getting people to stop running on-prem Exchange and use more um, you know, hosted uh, Exchange. Um, but that would be a sort of disingenuous um, 
motivation if we were to attribute that to them and say that they thought this is a, a good business move, um, you know, to sort of patch it and make people want to pull forward any plans they may have had uh, to moving away from uh, Outlook Web Access running on-prem to running in the cloud. Uh, let's see, most likely Microsoft patched them before they're making their announcement um, and uh, additional mitigations. And oh, it's interesting to note, for those that are unable to patch right away for whatever reason, they don't have approval, they need to do testing in a lower environment because that's their process and procedure. There's actually some IIS rewrite rules that can provide some protection against the SSRF, you know, the uh, server-side um, request forgery of all, uh, which is CBE 2021-26855. Uh, and the other vulnerabilities are actually turned off, um, are actually mitigated by turning off uh, Exchange Control Panel, uh, ECP, and OAB, uh, which is Offline Address Book. So if you are an Exchange Administrator and you haven't patched yet, I highly recommend you take a look at the, these stories. Um, they're all linked you know, all over the place now uh, in our uh, InfoSec News Channel, as well as just searching for it uh, on, on the web. And as I said before, Microsoft released these updates and security patches out of band, which means that they're not within their regular patch Tuesday cycle uh, each month. All right, so uh, there's some historical information on zero days. Average days to exploit after a security vulnerability was disclosed. So in this chart, you see between 2006 and 2017. In 2006, the average time to exploit open source vulnerabilities after disclosure was 45 days. In 2010, it was around 30 days. And then in 2017, that dropped to two days. And of course, now um, it's basically zero days, right? The average number of days to exploit showing up. And so you used to have some time, right? To sort of breathe and uh, prepare your patching and get your systems ready and, uh, you know, uh, prepare for the attack. But now there's just all sorts of zero days showing up all the time and uh, novel ways of attacking systems. It's uh, never a dull day in the world of an infosec professional, that's what I say. All right, so managing vulnerabilities. So there's at least three main areas in which you can mitigate and manage your vulnerabilities. You can work on your OS security patching. You, know, you can work on your application patching. And of course, you can do vulnerability scanning uh, to verify that the patching that you're doing is actually effective. Vulnerability management is actually a, a lot like juggling, except it's not for entertainment purposes. We as InfoSec professionals keep a lot of balls in the air, a lot of systems and applications. Those are the balls in the air. So let's jump into these three areas of work. I'm not including secure development and best practices for coding uh, in today's discussion. Secure development uh, will be discussed in, in week number 12, I think. Uh, but numerous different techniques and solutions exist uh, that significantly hinder the exploitation of vulnerabilities in programming. And several mechanisms can be used. So we will get to that uh, in another lecture. Um, that's weird. It feels like the slides aren't updating uh, when I'm clicking next. Anyway, so this was the slide for managing vulnerabilities in the three areas. Uh, that we're going to dive into. So let's take a look at OS security patching. This is your baseline, right? The operating system, whether that's a tablet, a mobile phone, a computer laptop, a workstation, or a server. Each device has an operating system, and there are a set of updates and hot fixes that have to be applied regularly in order to reduce the risk that vulnerabilities bring. One way to reduce the workload of OS security patching is actually to limit the number of operating systems in use. Um, it seems kind of basic, but you'd be surprised at the number of companies that have um, you know, three or four different distributions of Linux running at the same time, um, two or three different versions of Windows running, so Windows Server 2016, 2012, um, you know, Ubuntu, Debian, you know, Red Hat, CentOS, um, uh, all sorts of uh, variations there. Of course, if you have less operating systems to patch and you standardize on one or two, uh, that keeps the work down a lot because each one's a force multiplier. Uh, let's see, standardizing on one Linux distribution can help keep the level of that effort that goes into maintaining OS updates and security patches manageable. Certifying the latest Windows Server version as compatible with your application stack is an important task and it's often ignored. 
uh, the InfoSec team, or at least the IS team, ought to be certifying, you know, when Big Sur came out uh, for OS X, uh, for example, uh, there was a lot of software that wouldn't run correctly, uh, or the new hardware on the M1 ARM chips uh, that are inside the Apple uh, latest uh, release of hardware. Uh, a lot of apps needed to be uh, recompiled and rebuilt uh, to run on it. So you can't just sort of update as soon as the update becomes available. Sometimes you need to kind of hold back uh, the latest and greatest uh, using your mobile device management tools uh, to make sure that the team has had time to run all of the apps that your business needs to uh, do its work uh, and certify them before releasing it and, and giving everyone the chance to update. Uh, let's see. So let's see, that's often ignored. Um, how many companies are still running unsupported and out of date versions of Windows out there? I would say almost all of them. I'm, I don't think I've met a company that's uh, been entirely up to date uh, and not using some form of, of legacy Windows. Windows 2008, for example, just went end of support in January of 2020. So just January of last year. And keep in mind, Windows 2008 uh, was released in 2009. Uh, so that means what, um, you know, 21 years of, of service. Um, and you can imagine there's a lot of people that still need and are mounting programs and campaigns within their organization uh, to um, decommission Windows 2008 servers for various reasons. You know, like I said, legacy software that's running on it that's not supported, but they haven't switched uh, to something more modern. Uh, who knows uh, what all the reasons might be. All right, so let's talk about OS security updates. Uh, network OS, Microsoft's Patch Tuesday, uh, Linux patch package managers uh, like Yum or Apt uh, for Debian and for Red Hat. Uh, Mac OS and iOS, they have their different tools uh, for updating. Uh, Android, of course, uh, there's also firmware updates for us to discuss and something called a BIOS update. So some of you might not be uh, have been around long enough uh, in the world of computers to uh, know that BIOS updates used to be much more prevalent uh, in, in our jobs and in our work uh, building infrastructure. Um, but it's still a problem and a lot of people ignore it. And uh, some of the bad guys are working out ways to actually um, remain persistent on a system that they've compromised by changing the BIOS and injecting code into it so that the operating system doesn't even know uh, that there's a BIOS vulnerability or a backdoor a rootkit potentially that's been installed. And here, what do I have? Um, a sort of digital quilt uh, that looks like a printed circuit board that someone had made. And so I thought that was kind of a nice way to show how all the different patching things go together for all these different components. All right, next up. Hello, there we go. Um, <clears throat> OS security updates, let's talk about network updates. So the network operating systems have plenty of exposures to risk and uh, code that can be exploited. So we're a long way from the days when this four node ARPA network uh, diagram in, from 1969 uh, that's shown here. A modern network router has millions of lines of code and plenty of opportunity for bugs and vulnerabilities to exist. Network updates need to be applied to keep the network itself from being abused by an attacker. What better way to spread malicious code in a platform than to attack and infect the very fabric of connections and communications between devices? Um, certainly, it's a lot easier to hack the switch and then be able to gain access to networks that were not uh, exposed to the internet. And uh, this is something that some advanced per persistent threats have been targeting and focusing is that if they compromise something you know in the dmz people think oh well there's a firewall and, and and protections you know that even if you lose something in the dmz it's maybe not the worst thing in the world because all of your crown jewels should be in a you know more protected back-end network uh, with additional firewalls in between it but if you can access the switches you can actually bypass those firewalls and so hacking the switch and having network vulnerabilities network operating system vulnerabilities uh, is certainly part of uh, the entire program that we have to mount uh, for vulnerability management. So you need to know what versions of network OS are on all of your switches, routers, firewalls, and other network gear. Um, continuing on, uh, Microsoft OS security updates. Every month there's this ritual of Patch Tuesday. Uh, it's observed uh, and uh, the devout uh, assemble every month uh, to review them. Uh, it occurs every second Tuesday of the month since 2003 or so. 
And it's actually an unofficial name for the day on which Microsoft releases software patches for its operating system and for its applications. February 2020 saw 99 vulnerabilities included, which was the largest um, set of updates at that time. But along came June 2020 and Patch Tuesday, uh, it was topped and beaten uh, with uh, 129 updates that were released on Patch Tuesday, June 2020. And I think 11 of them were critical. And so I can imagine that this, this record will be broken again uh, fairly soon. Um, if you start to look at the trends, you know, uh, in attacking the OS and uh, getting at, um, you know, exposed services uh, like uh, email and exchange. Uh, another aspect uh, related to Microsoft uh, OS security updates, I just call it next, next finish, um, referring to the typical system update buttons for a Windows update where you hit next, next, and then eventually finish. Finish is actually a bit of a problem. Um, especially when you're just deploying the hotfixes and installation binaries and new libraries of code, it's actually not enough. So what I'm referring to here are registry updates for Windows and other requirements for closing the security vulnerability in the OS. Uh, so it's not unusual for there to be a um, KB, right? A knowledge base um, article, which comes down as a KB with a number .exe on a Windows machine. You run that as a part of Windows Update or some type of patching tool like um, SCCM, uh, which is a configuration uh, management tool for, for Windows. And uh, you can install the vulnerability uh, library update, but you may not have actually mitigated the vulnerability until you've made a corresponding registry change. You may need to set some variable in the registry from zero to one or from one to zero or you may need to actually create that registry entry because it didn't exist yet. And so it's important to realize that sometimes in this debate between vulnerability scanners and Windows Update, Windows Update says, okay, I have nothing left to update. I've run and applied all of the patches and you know, KBs uh, that need uh, to be applied to the system. But the vulnerability scanner will come in and say, oh, you're still vulnerable to it because the vulnerability scanner is often checking for that registry entry or a special configuration change that needs to be happening. And so a lot of times teams are just applying the KBs, the, the binaries and the library updates, but they're not actually patching the system. And so that's where it can be the case that both are true, right? That Windows has nothing more to update from Windows update point of view. The vulnerability scanner says you're still vulnerable. And so you have to look more closely at the vulnerability and read the Microsoft um, details on the KB on the, on the knowledge base article. And you'll see that you know you need to make a change in the registry. One example would be disabling TLS version 1.0 from your web server, right? Uh, nobody should be running TLS 1.0 or SSL v2 or SSL v3, uh, but a lot of the older Windows OSs use those as by default. And you need to apply an update and then start using TLS 1.2 or TLS 1.3. Uh, but the old protocols are still um, uh, accepted and still operative. And so they don't go away until you go into the registry and make a change to disable them. Uh, so you may have been, you know, applied an update, but it, like I said, you can still be vulnerable to some of the attacks against the weaker uh, protocols like SSL v2, SSL v3, TLS 1.0, and TLS 1.1. I think it was even Microsoft's Edge browser that has stopped um, uh, using TLS 1.0 as a default as of like June last year. Uh, and so basically it's considered a weak deprecated protocol because it can be broken uh, in various ways, uh, man in the middle attacks and things like that. Uh, so anyway, yeah, always be um, working closely to believe the error message, even if the um, infrastructure services IS team says, oh, we applied all the updates. And then you run the scanning as an infosec person and you say, no, no, this says you know, that you're still uh, supporting you know, TLS 1.0. And then the answer, like I said, lies in updating the registry. All right, so what's next? Um, OS security updates for Linux. So in Linux, we have things called package managers uh, like apt, apt, and yum. And uh, they help make OS security updates for Linux servers and devices fairly easy. Depending on which Linux distribution that you're using, uh, Red Hat, CentOS, Ubuntu, uh, SUSE, uh, Debian, etc., there will be a package manager available that can perform the core security updates on the server. So you may not want to apply all available updates. Uh, there's special commands that you can give to yum, for example, uh, which would tell it to only apply the security updates. Because 
essentially it should be the uh, developers that decide when to move on uh, to different package versions. Uh, take Java, for example. Uh, one of most um, InfoSec teams bane of existence is the thousands or different versions of Java that end up being installed on servers uh, because of developers requirements and embedded versions of Java that come with packages that are bundled. Uh, you could have a JRE, a Java runtime environment, or a JDK, a Java development uh, kit. Uh, Java JDK basically means you have a compiler available, right? And JRE is just a runtime environment, so there's no compiler. And people, for a long time at least, used to believe that if you had a JRE instead of a JDK version of Java installed, you were more protected um, because you weren't sort of giving compilation tools to bad guys you know, to compile binaries. Um, but oftentimes, I think it's a bit outdated, that kind of thinking. Um, because the bad guys bring their own toolkits, uh, or they live off the land and they find ways to get you know compiled binaries for your architecture for their exploits onto it, uh, without needing to exploit, you know your Java compiler uh, to compile the code uh, to take over your system. Uh, so I think that uh, anyway, well, that's been a, a pattern in, in my experience, uh, working with lots of um, teams to remediate vulnerabilities, is to get everyone on the latest stable and secure versions of Java and to root out all the other versions that have been installed because uh, they can be used and abused, of course, uh, by the bad actors. All right, let's talk about Mac OS and iOS. So there's over 1.5 billion active devices worldwide. Last year, I think it was 1.4. And so I updated the slide with the latest numbers. Um, what else is interesting to say about Macs? Um, they're not impervious, actually, uh, to, um, to vulnerabilities. Uh, Mac threats increased by more than 400% year on year in 2019. And the February 2020 malware bytes state of malware report uh, took a deep dive into the real world threats that face Android and iOS users uh, and certain browser based attacks, uh, which affect both Mac and Windows PCs. So in the olden days, you know, fairly, I don't know how long ago, maybe you know, five, 10 years ago, um, a lot of InfoSec people just ran Mac uh, OS uh, as their default uh, because there were less vulnerabilities they had to worry about, right? Like all these Microsoft ones coming out all the time. Uh, but that's not so much true anymore. There's certainly Linux vulnerabilities and Linux malware uh, that apply to the underlying OS inside under the hood. Uh, Darwin, I think, is an open BSD based OS, if I remember correctly. And uh, there's certainly lots of um, you know, potential to compromise a Mac these days uh, with uh, the more of them there are, uh, the more attention they get from the bad actors. Uh, talking about Android, uh, there's well over 2.5 billion active Android devices, according to Google's uh, 2019 data. I couldn't find any 2020 data to see how much that has increased, but I presume it has. Um, and that doesn't even include the non-Google Play Store count of devices, uh, like, for example, Amazon's Fire OS or various Android variants that come out of China. Uh, since they're not allowed due to embargo and, and export restrictions, they're not allowed to use Android uh, anymore. So they basically had to create a branch or a fork of Android OS uh, to support their devices and uh, their OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers. Uh, what's interesting from a security perspective is that not even half of all devices are running one of the most two recent releases of Android. Uh, so there's basically a very big adoption lag for Android as an OS. Some of this is due to the fragmentation that's caused by various OEMs uh, releasing newer hardware and their older devices just simply aren't supported uh, by the latest Android OS updates and releases. And so I have a stat in here from androidpolice.com uh, that gave me this 2.5 billion number. And, uh, you know, some of the mobile carriers actually make modifications to the Android OS as well, because they want to try to bundle services to consume uh, mobile traffic, uh, watching videos and, you know, streaming uh, movies and games and things like that. And so that's one of the reasons that contributes to the Android um, not lack of adoption and staying up to date. Uh, this was, I think, 2019. This pie chart shows some of the problem. What it represents is data that was collected on a seven day period ending on May 7th in 2019. Um, and it shows that you know, the latest versions of Android uh, haven't been picked up, right? 
um, any version with less than 0.1% distribution isn't actually in this chart. Um, but this came from statista.com. And I have a, a more recent chart that I gathered for you about this. Um, and I hope those slides are showing up correctly. This was the previous one. Hopefully you were watching and seeing this one on the screen for a while, uh, just so that you can capture it. Uh, lollipop, um, nougat, uh, Oreo, pie. And so this is a more recent stat that I found uh, also on statista.com. So the Android operating system share worldwide by OS from 2013 until 2020. So Pi 9.0 was the most popular version of Android uh, as of April 2020, with a market share of only 31.3% though. Um, despite being released in the fall of 2015, Marshmallow 6.0 was still the second most widely used version of Android's operating system on smartphone devices as of then. Uh, developers, uh, Google previously named its Android versions um, after items of confectionery, right? Um, but you know, nougat and and, and um, lollipop. But in a break from that tradition, the latest release in September of 2019 is simply called Android 10, uh, which had a share of only 8.3 percent seven months after its release. Uh, Android Pi was initially re released in August of 2018. So if you look at it in here, Pi is that dark blue um, that only really shows up in the first half of 2019. And then it has a significant share, like we said, um, what was it, um, Pi 9 reached 31% uh, in the first half of 2020. Um, and then Oreo was released in August of 2017. So Oreo, I think, is the gray one uh, on here. And so you can kind of see that, uh, you know, there's a huge lag uh, in, in devices and updates and security updates. And so it's very profitable uh, to develop Android malware and get bad uh, software into the Google Play Store and to uh, take people's identity, you know, access their bank accounts, um, uh, do all sorts of nefarious things. Um, let's see. And I think I have, yes, I have the same graph uh, for Apple. Now notice the stark contrast, right? Uh, this graph represents a share of Apple iPhones by iOS version worldwide from 2016 until half of 2020 as well. Uh, the new mobile operating system, or at least it was new at the time, and now it's uh, iOS 14. But anyway, iOS 13 was installed, as of this graph, uh, on 81% of iPhones that accessed the App Store in June of 2020. And its predecessor, uh, iOS 12, was running on 13% of mobile devices. So that means that you had, what, um, 81 and 13 is like 94% of all devices um, talking to the App Store in June of last year, we're running the latest or the latest minus one. Uh, so that means the ob obvious observation that, you know, iPhone adapters, uh, OS adopters um, pick them up much more rapidly. Uh, and of course, what else? Uh, the latest version of iOS is now 14.4. It was released in January of 2021. And according to one source, iOS 14 was installed on 81% of iPhones sold over the last four years and 72% of all devices. Um, so the whole backwards compatibility aspect um, still obtains for Mac, uh, for iOS, for Apple devices, uh, but not on the order of magnitude that we're seeing with Android. Another area within OS security updates is the firmware. So laptops and servers have a ROM with firmware on it that needs to be updated. Shown here is a Z80 processor. Uh, the Sinclair ZX80 was a home computer launched in 29th of January in 1980 by Science of Cambridge Limited, later to be better known as Sinclair Research. Uh, it's a notable for being one of the first computers available in the United Kingdom for less than 100 pounds. It was available in a kit form for 79.95 British pounds sterling, uh, where purchasers actually had to assemble and solder it together. And then the, there was also a ready-built version, which sold for 99 pounds and 95 pence. Uh, and the ZX80 was a very popular uh, machine straight away. And for some time, there was actually a waiting list of several months uh, for either version of, of the machine. I myself had a Timex Sinclair 1000, which was the US market's version of the ZX80 and the ZX81 processor. This was a computer that had 2K of memory uh, to begin with and it had a membrane keyboard. Um, 
not even like these chiclets kind of keyboards, but um, just uh, like um, what you would see on a uh, on an ATM uh, or on uh, certain types of um, you know flat uh, numeric displays, and you could get a 16K expansion memory pack for it. So imagine you know, writing code and and you know, playing around and trying to make games and and do interesting things on a computer with only 16K of memory. Uh, but that was back, like I said. Uh, in the 80s uh, and so that kind of shows you, you know, how long i've been around uh, playing with computers i guess uh, and then now the bios um, the one that i want to mention is a little bit different than the firmware so similar to firmware updates uh, but it's related to the computer's motherboard uh, so the bios uh, basic input output system is the program that a personal computer's microprocessor uses to get the computer system started after you turn it on it also manages data flow between the computer's operating system, like Windows or Linux. Uh, so you still have to update the BIOS, regardless of whether you're running on an x86 or x64 system, whether you're running Linux or Windows or some other OS, uh, you still need the BIOS. That's the common element. Uh, and so the BIOS, for example, what it helps the operating system talk to the hard drive, to the video adapter, to the keyboard and the mouse, uh, which would be on the message, you know, um, serial bus and uh, printer ports and things like that. Uh, most users never actually interact with the BIOS, uh, but it presents uh, briefly during boot time. And so if you hit a special key, um, often uh, F2 on a, on a Windows type machine, uh, you actually stop the normal boot sequence. And then you're presented with this kind of text-based interface that I've shown a snapshot of here uh, for sending options and uh, selecting options and parameters for the hardware. For example, you can select the boot order, right? Do you look on a floppy drive for back when computers had them? Uh, or do you look on an optical CD-ROM drive? And then do you look on a hard drive? Or then do you try to look for a network boot um, device and to use a you know, network boot protocol? Um, or you can make network boot first, right? And if there's no network card, then it will boot off of you know, something local to the device. Anyway, so that's a little bit about uh, BIOS um, for those of you that have never seen this kind of a screen before. And those have to be updated. All right, so now that we've um, got a good baseline uh, for patching the operating system regularly. The next focus is application security updates. So a good number of privilege escalation techniques take advantage of vulnerabilities in applications on servers and workstations instead of OS vulnerabilities. All right, so we spoke uh, previously about the OSI model, right? And uh, its competitor, the TCP IP model. Uh, both have an application layer um, but they're not actually mapped one to one. And of course, the OS spans several of the OSI layers uh, just to help confuse the issue a bit further. Uh, so here's a couple of examples of uh, comparing OSI model to the TCP model. And uh, I don't know, I don't think I need to dive into them as examples here, but you, know, you can see which layer they uh, operate in. Uh, useful, useful tidbit. Uh, some people will often ask a question, you know, and ask you to say, all right, give me an example of a protocol that operates at layer seven. Uh, so you see layer seven in the TCP model, uh, you would say, you know, file transfer protocol or, you know, SMTP, um, simple mail transfer protocol, right, uh, on port 25. And then other people might ask you, okay, tell me something that operates, you know, at the network level, layer three. And so there's different um, protocols and answers that you can have uh, to answer those questions. Uh, always good to brush up on them before an interview if you're taking something that's a you know a technical role. All right, so let's talk about application security. Uh, we have not won the battle if we have not applied the application security updates. So there is also a degree of interaction and dependency though uh, that links OS updates and application security updates. Think for example of core libraries uh, being updated as a part of an OS update like libcrypto or libssl. Uh, which delivers TLS capability and which depends on lib crypto. So how, for example, can a web browser application support TLS version 1.3 or TLS version 1.2 if the underlying OS libraries are not supporting it? Uh, so there are certain like, dependencies. You can't get um, you know, a strong uh, OS application updates to, and these are very specific examples that I used in this slide, uh, because it's a very real example. Certain versions of Red Hat, for example, don't have support for TLS 1.1 or higher, uh, let alone 1.2 or 1.3. And so if you don't upgrade the base OS, um, you're kind of going off the, um, you know, 
off the chain of support uh, to try to compile and build those libraries uh, for an older OS. And some of the underlying dependencies might not be there, like I said, for libssl or for libcrypto. So it's generally the case that uh, you want to move them along together as a set, right? Uh, which application versions you have and are supported and which uh, base OS uh, they're supported running on. Uh, one of my favorite vulnerabilities uh, that I like to mention regarding uh, packages and, and OS, and I think I've mentioned this before, this is one of my interview questions. When I talk to DevOps engineers or if I talk and I'm interviewing for someone for an InfoSec position on my team, um, Heartbleed. So Heartbleed was an OpenSSL library vulnerability that was disclosed in 2014. It was also known as um, CVE 2014-0160. So the vulnerability entails improper input validation uh, due to a missing bounds check in the implementation of the TLS heartbeat extension that was meant to keep a secure, secure connection alive. So you don't have to pay a big OS, you know, um, computational overhead every time uh, you're trying to, you know, pause and, and read a page that's on a secure page. And maybe there's an idle timeout. And then you wanted to reestablish that, you know, secure connection again when you click next, right? Or you click on a link on that page and you're asking the server for another, you know, um, uh, page to be downloaded. And so basically what we know is it was introduced by a T-Mobile worker um, to the open source package and it was introduced in 2012. There's some speculation as to whether this was an intentional vulnerability or not, um, but everyone had to get new certificates uh, due to this vulnerability. And everyone, of course, had to patch their OpenSSL libraries to the latest version. Uh, and that includes uh, load balancers, um, firewalls, anything that does SSL termination uh, needed to have its OpenSSL uh, libraries updated. And even if you had a valid certificate that was good for another year or two, you had to have new certificates issued. And the reason why is because a specially crafted packet uh, due to this vulnerability uh, without authenticating could actually retrieve 64K of memory from the server. And if you crafted enough of these packets, you could actually reassemble the entire contents of memory of the server. And so the idea is that uh, you had to issue the certificates that you were running for your website again and have them reissued from your registrar, uh, whether it was GoDaddy or Thought or VeriSign or something like that, uh, because you had to consider that the private key had been compromised. Why? because the private key is held in memory uh, and it's part of the, the web server, you know, um, footprint in memory. And so I use this as a phone screen question uh, with pretty good success. Um, I asked them to explain, and if they don't remember the vulnerability or if they even weren't working uh, in IT in the year 2014, uh, what I'll do is I'll explain the vulnerability just like I have now, but I'll leave out the part about the private key being exposed and, and I'll ask them. So based on the nature of the vulnerability I just described, tell me why everyone had to get their certificates reissued um, and revoke you know, the previous ones. And basically someone could do a perfect man in the middle attack um, if they had your private key. And so you wouldn't know that you weren't talking to the actual server and they could decrypt your traffic um, from a Starbucks or anywhere in, you know, in, on the routes and hops on the internet uh, between you and uh, the server you're talking to. Uh, let's see, so anyone not familiar with that, um, it helps surface their ability to think about security problems and the exposure of private keys. So that's why I like to mention Heartbleed. As of July, what, 2019, um, Shodan.io, and if you've not seen that site before, I suggest you check it out, um, reported that there were 91,063 devices still vulnerable to this Heartbleed. That's five years later. Uh, and checking Shodan last summer, um, I saw there were at least uh, 1,280 sites or more uh, that were still vulnerable. And so in terms of vulnerability management, there's a lot of people that are, you know, not keeping up. And that's uh, a, definitely a risk. Uh, WordPress security. Um, WordPress for me is a bit of a poster child for insecure um, application. Uh, there are over 3,000 and 3,087 entries in the National Vulnerability Database just for WordPress. And there were 560 CVEs uh, that have been recorded against uh, the application. Last summer, those numbers were 2,800 entries and 457 uh, vulnerabilities, uh, CVEs. Um, WordPress is an easy to use and popular website publishing application. 
Uh, by some counts, I think 40 to 60% of all websites are actually running on WordPress. Uh, but one which brings with it a lot of security trouble due to the number of plugins and extensions that are written for it. Um, and, uh, you know, for which many of them don't have much security uh, maturity about them. So dating back to 2003, uh, there are basically several critical issues uh, and vulnerabilities every few months uh, for WordPress. So I would recommend using a third party to host it for you because they're going to be better, you know, at patching it and keeping it up to date than you will yourself. Um, unless, of course, you want the burden of, of, of running web WordPress. And oftentimes, like I said, people find a, an obscure plugin or extension uh, that's supported by, you know, one guy and his dog in a garage or something, right? A 0 0.1 version of something clever that they created for WordPress. So you can manage that risk a little bit uh, by making sure that you don't uh, use those sort of unsupported, not very popular, but interesting um, plugins. Uh, talking about application security, we can mention Oracle for a minute. They have a, a special language that they use, a special set of um, abbreviations. So they speak in terms of PSUs and BPs and RUs. So a PSU is a patch set update. And that usually contains security fixes and regression fixes, um, i.e. bug fixes. Uh, then they'll come out with a bundle patch, uh, a BP, which is a superset of a PSU containing the PSU, but also has some optimizer fixes and some functional fixes. So now you're getting away from just you know, security updates and bugs, but the actual functional fixes, uh, feature changes. And then, of course, RU stands for a release update. Uh, and technically, there's also something called an RUR, which is a release update revision, which contains security updates, but not the optimizer fixes or functional fixes, and they come out quarterly. So the reason I mention this is that many teams plan to just try to keep up with the RUs. Uh, so which RU are you going to apply? Do you have a time, you know, because typically Oracle systems uh, are running for finance and back end, you know, and people need to do, you know, end of month and end of quarter. And so oftentimes it's difficult to figure out when you can run and apply these uh, Oracle updates and patches um, because uh, it's always happening right at the time uh, when uh, they have change freezes, right? Because they want to run the books and they don't want the books to get, um, you know, uh, delayed uh, because, you know, the security team insisted that, a, you know, a release update be applied. Uh, so sometimes, you know, if someone's good, they'll keep up and they'll do four Oracle updates uh, per year. Uh, but oftentimes they'll miss one uh, just because of change freezes, like I said, or, or critical timing that this doesn't work out. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit about Oracle's patching uh, cycles and application updates. There's many, many more applications we can think about. And, you know, there's many, many more open source components as well, not just commercial software to consider. Uh, but that was a few of them. Uh, so OSS, what does OSS stand for? It stands for open source software. And these components represent a significant attack vector. Uh, with uh, over 300,000 downloads per year of open source components for the average organization. That's a lot of downloads. Um, it's an unfortunate fact that all of these downloads are not for the latest stable and secure version of the component. Um, some of the things I got out of the Sonatype um, 2019 report, which is in our Git repo, and I added some fresh slides um, just this morning looking at their 2020 report. But it's worth mentioning some of the stats from 2019 uh, and checking that out. Uh, so for NPM alone, there are over 800,000 unique JavaScript components uh, available, uh, about 3,000 of which are needed to build a website with rounded corners, it would seem. Um, in 2018, the average NPM package downloads were recorded at 3.5 billion. In 2019, that rose to 10 billion. So that's a huge jump um, with an estimated population of around 9.7 million JavaScript developers worldwide back in that uh, 2019 report. That basically equates to the average developer sourcing over 53,000 packages per year. Now, obviously, um, CICD, right? Continuous integration, continuous deployment um, uh, is driving this. But how much InfoSec review and scanning uh, is happening uh, on these packages? Uh, not a lot, right? Developers are just sourcing stuff and using it. And you know, it could be you know, supply chain uh, attacks. There could be you know, malicious code in it. And there's some very good examples of that. 
uh, that I've, uh, I think, spoken about before. There was a node uh, package called Event Stream, uh, which was um, what I called a sub-zero day, where they injected a vulnerability into the source code of the of the open source package, and they waited it for it for it to be released because they knew it was used in Bitcoin wallets, and they knew they could actually extract bitcoins um, from people and, and steal untold millions. Um, what else uh, did I have here for this slide? Um, since two thousand five. Sonatype uh, has, and sonatype.com is their website, has curated and operated what's called the central repository, uh, formerly the Apache Maven repository, uh, which serviced 146 billion download requests for component releases from developers around the world in 2019 alone. Uh, so they know a lot about who's using what open source software and what versions people are downloading and how long it takes people to download the latest version after it's been released. Uh, so there's some interesting stats on the next slide that I want to share with you. But basically, this uh, 2019 report from Sun and Type and the 2020 report are in their repo. So this is an infographic that comes from the 2020 report. Some of the high level numbers from the supply chain software supply chain report for 2020 blends a broad set of public and proprietary data, actually. So they buy data to augment what they're able to observe themselves by hosting the repository. Uh, and then, of course, they send out a survey. So they have survey results in 2020 from over 5,600 professional developers uh, to reveal some very important findings, uh, including 430% uh, growth in next generation cyber attacks that are actively targeting open source software projects. That's huge, 430% growth in, in one year. Uh, 1.5 trillion open source component and container download requests in 2020. Um, I think what the number we talked about before was, you know, in the billions, now we've reached trillions. Um, another metric that they have here is 530 times faster, the mean time to update dependencies, and 2.8 times more commits for exemplary open source projects. So they're looking at the cadence at which, you know, updates are provided for Tomcat, um, you know, Nginx, um, uh, Lodash, all sorts of different packages that are used uh, to build websites, right? And people source them, like I said, 53,000 per developer, 300,000 components downloaded, you know, per company on average. And uh, what was another metric? Um, uh, 26 times faster detection and remediation of open source vulnerabilities for what are called the high performance enterprise development teams. Uh, and then 11% of open source components used in applications have known vulnerabilities. So that's a fairly easy number to uh, multiply out if you just round down to 10%. So basically what I'm saying is that if you're not scanning your repositories for usage of vulnerable open source software, then you're missing a significant and growing portion of your risk. Some additional stats from the 2019 report, uh, medium time to remediation, uh, MTTR, uh, that's the time required for a component team to remediate or fix any security vulnerabilities reported against their dependencies was in, I think, yes, um, in 2019, it was 180 days. Uh, the time to remediate clock actually starts only after the fix is published, not when the vulnerability is disclosed uh, or reported. As an example, um, Prime Faces is a Java UI framework whose team they became aware of a vulnerability and fixed it in February 2016. So that's within the top 5% of um, time to remediate. But the CVE was not assigned until 2017, perhaps due to the staffing shortage that I mentioned a few slides back. And so it was not actually published in the NVD until January of 2018. So this means that scanning software like Qualys, Nessus, Rapid7, they might not pick up the risk to your organization until 11 months of exploitability uh, when conditions ex conspire you know, against you in this case, right? Where there was a delayed tagging of the vulnerability uh, due to short staffing at, at NIST. Uh, and of course, um, bleeding edge is also a very real phenomenon. 
So 400 Java libraries, right, um, were monitored uh, for 116 days. And some researchers found that 282 commits actually contained breaking changes. Uh, so there's basically a prob problematic logic to operating with an N minus one update compliance policy for certain kinds of software and software components. Because if you work on that bleeding edge, you're gonna get some of those breaking changes and you're gonna be the one that's bleeding and then reporting it, committing it back in, the developers then fix it and then people that are you know, staying out of sync and not updating as frequently don't experience that disruption. Uh, certainly the case with SolarWinds, if you were you know, um, over a year old in updating your SolarWinds version, you actually didn't have the backdoor um, installed. And so it's kind of a, a perverse um, reinforcement of not patching and keeping up to date uh, because of these attacks that are coming through the supply chain. Uh, but this bears a little bit more discussion. So I've got a couple more slides that I pulled uh, together out of uh, the Sonatype report. And again, you know, disclosures of um, you know uh, allegiances aside, um, I don't own stock in Sonatype. I'm not on their board of directors. You know, there's no affiliation with NYU or Security Scorecard where I work. Um, I'm just saying it's a great source of information because of all of this data that they have and how they share it and, and the ability to detect this ever-growing threat. So on this slide, we're looking at the next generation of cyber attacks that are actively targeting open source software projects. Uh, and they have increased, as I mentioned, 430% since they published the report last year. Uh, from 2015 until June 2019, only 216 such attacks were recorded. But then from July 2019 until May 2020, an additional 929 attacks were documented. The most common type of attack in this area is typo squatting. Uh, which is an indirect attack vector. It preys on developers making otherwise innocent typos when searching for popular components. Uh, another common attack is malicious code injection, which is carried out through a variety of means, including stealing credentials from a project maintainer. Um, and uh, when malicious code is deliberately and secretly injected upstream into an open source project, it's highly likely that nobody knows the malware is there except for the person that planted it. Uh, this approach allows adversaries to surreptitiously set traps upstream and then carry out attacks downstream, aka people using the open source software and releasing it uh, as a part of their uh, updates to their packages and apps on their sites, uh, like struts and things like that. Uh, once the vulnerable code has moved through the supply chain and into the wild. I'm not saying the struts vulnerabilities were backdoored or supply chain attacks, but there is that lag right um, between when it's in the repo, when people have dev tested it and QA tested it, and when they actually push out the updates uh, to production. Uh, so that's a huge, you know, obviously the graph makes it pretty dramatic, you know, to see that the number of attacks are increasing. And what we just saw um, with uh, SolarWinds, of course, falls into this. And I think Sol Sonatype published a blog post recently uh, that shows that, you um, there were like 5,000 NPM packages that have come in uh, for what are called dependency confusion. Uh, I like to think of it as collision, name collision. Basically, if you're publishing a vulnerability, no, if you're publishing a, a, a package for NPM and you simply increment your version number, uh, that can convince lots of packaging and uh, build software to pull it from a public repo uh, and to pull it from you. Uh, even though you're not uh, the authoritative source. So you need to be more careful about scoping um, your uh, build uh, scripts to make sure that they don't just arbitrarily pick up uh, the highest version number because it may not be, you know, it could be a security researcher that was making a point, uh, which was an article I think we talked about last week. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's uh, lots and lots of um, you know, fun uh, in a bad way uh, for the bad guys and for us to mitigate that. Um, but anyway, there are ways to scan for it and to keep your repo uh, locked down. Uh, I guess you could think of it as similar to um, the uh, attacks that were, let's see. Um, yeah, the BGP hijacking. It's similar to BGP hijacking, right? Because if somebody advertises a shorter route to a particular net block or ASN, uh, autonomous system number, uh, the traffic's going to just go that way. And uh, there's been a lot of BGP hijacking uh, in the last couple of years where because of the trust, you know, that's kind of inherent in the system, uh, that people believe that this wouldn't happen, people wouldn't do bad things by advertising shorter routes. You could have what's called 
scenic routing right through Russia or through China uh, between you and your laptop and you know your bank um, you know wherever your banking infrastructure is is posted uh, it could be man in the middle attacks by these bad actors one of the last thing I want to pull out of the um, Sona type 2020 report uh, was this interesting sort of um, concentration risk you might call it so in 2019 Darmstadt University researchers found that a typical NPM package contained an abnormally large number of dependencies, loading an average of 79 third-party packages from 39 different maintainers. And the research team also found that there were 391 highly influential project contributors that affect more than 10,000 components through their complex web of dependencies. So let's say that if an adversary were to successfully identify entry points into projects supported by one of those 391 maintainers, they could dramatically widen the aperture and impact of their open source supply chain attacks. For example, the Darmstadt team said that adversaries gaining access to just 20 popular NPM maintainer accounts could deploy malicious code impacting more than half of the entire NPM ecosystem. Uh, and the reference for this is uh, Marcus Zimmerman and uh, Christian Alexandru Statsu uh, from the Technical University in Darmstadt in Germany, and uh, Cam Tenney, uh, Michael Pradel, also from the Technische Universität Darmstadt. Uh, so we thank them for that. So basically, this curve you know, hits uh, an asymptote uh, quite quickly uh, with just a few uh, compromised um, maintainers and then uh, and cooking up um, bad. Uh, bad open source uh, upstream libraries. All right, so I think we're at uh, one hour and a few minutes. So let me pause for a second to, to hydrate. And I'm on slide 37. So that's a pretty good place to be. All right. Vulnerability scanning. So we patch and we reboot and we trust that the vulnerabilities have been closed, right? No we have to scan. And authenticated scanning is becoming much more important in order to avoid a bad signal to noise ratio for vulnerabilities. Um, unauthenticated scanning uh, is has its certain value, um, but oftentimes there'll be false positives. And so that's why I talk about authenticated scanning, where the scanning appliance has credentials to actually log into the device and interrogate what versions of software are running. and. Uh, to um, help provide you know, perfect knowledge uh, of the vulnerabilities of a system. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, to, to do, uh, oh yes, uh, with ephemeral workloads and infrastructure being minted, born, and destroyed within minutes and hours, uh, the challenge of performing frequent and complete vulnerability scanning, of course, is growing. Uh, these are the things I've referred to before as June bug VMs, right? They live for a day or less. And if your scanning cadence is, you know, once a week, well, there's a whole bunch of June bugs that you're not even going to have scanned and known whether they were vulnerable or not between the time they were born and the time that they're destroyed. Uh, so obviously, elastic compute and auto scaling, you know, make this uh, even more challenging. In the area of vulnerability scans, you have unauthenticated versus authenticated. Uh, you have public versus internal. You have full versus partial. And you have a different approach to doing the scanning. Uh, you have agent-based and you have pollers or you know, things that are polling you know, and reaching out to the host, logging in and checking. Um, I would recommend doing all of them. And uh, there's a couple of reasons why. So unauthenticated scans um, are interesting to know sort of what the bad guys can see about you without having privileged access to the operating system. So you can think of that as your very visible bones. Uh, the authenticated scans, of course, can tell you even more, right? Um, let's say typical example, Red Hat's, you know, backports um, a vulnerability uh, and they don't increment the package and version number for SSH. Uh, but the vulnerability has been patched. So if you do an unauthenticated scan, you'd say, oh, you're running a vulnerable version of OpenSSH. It's only, you know, 4.22 or something. And uh, if you do the authenticated scan, then the uh, vulnerability scanner can come in and look at what particular backported version of SSH was there that it has that CVE, you know, mitigated, and it would then clear it up as not vulnerable. Uh, and it's good to run both times. And then you have public and internal. So you have a scanner appliance uh, on the inside of your network or several, 
and, and you have um, scanner appliances or cloud-based appliances uh, from a you know, cloud SaaS solution for your scanning, um, which is common these days with uh, um, hosting things in AWS as well. You can have a, an AMI that's permitted to do scanning. You're not allowed to do scanning without using an approved Qualys scanner or an approved Nessus scanner because uh, you need to kind of declare your guns like in the old days of the saloons in the Wild West, right? You needed to know who's doing what. You can't just go and fire up a random scanning app uh, on, on Amazon. Uh, it'll get shut down and reported uh, if you try to do that. Anyway, so you need a combination of public scans to look at your public facing IP footprint, uh, non-privileged, uh, and then you run internal authenticated scans as well. So you have a privileged view as to what's um, exposed and what's available and to have less false positives. And then full versus partial. <clears throat> this refers to the number of ports you know, that you scan. Uh, so I know when I was working at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, we only had a 15 minute window um, for scanning uh, between close of business and um, reporting uh, and then uh, opening up the, the markets and trading platform again um, for processing. And so we had to, you know, we didn't have time to scan all 65,000 and some ports. So we just scanned for the common, you know, uh, usual suspects, I guess you call it. Uh, and so you can do partial scans more frequently and then full scans less frequently. And that is a bit of a compromise between your ability to scan. Oftentimes you have to make sure that you're scanning when your apps are running. Well, some of your apps might shut down on the weekend to save, you know, cost because uh, they're not needed. And so if you run a full scan, you can find that there's nothing listening on a particular port, uh, vulnerable or not. And so it's good to make sure you understand when the apps are available and when they're doing things. Uh, and you don't want to, of course, um, trouble them by being scanned, which could potentially make them slow down. So if you're working in an environment where latency of your apps is, is critical to profitability or business insights and intelligence, uh, it's definitely the case that you need to coordinate you know, with the app owners uh, as to when these scans will occur. And then agent-based versus pollers. Agent-based, there's an agent running on the host. It checks maybe every four hours, you know, to see if anything's changed. And then it pushes what vulnerabilities it knows about up to the cloud or up to your, you know, um, portal and reporting server uh, versus uh, kind of a poll method, uh, P-U-L-L or P-O-L-L pollers, uh, where you have a scanner that then reaches out to a host, logs in, scans it, interrogates all the configurations and packages that are installed, uh, listeners and things like that, and then pulls the data back. So you can put windows around them, right? If it doesn't finish the scan within a couple of hours, you can tell it to just stop, or you can let it run indefinitely. And the more infrastructure you have, the longer it takes to scan, of course. Agent base is a lot better in many ways because they can all kind of push their data asynchronously um, up to you know, your uh, reporting uh, engine. Oh yeah, I think I mentioned this, unauthenticated versus authenticated. Uh, you're interrogating with pass. Oh, sorry, you can integrate it with the password balls. Uh, this is important, especially if you're using a SaaS based approach um, that you can avoid introducing uh, more root similar accounts um, for authenticated scanning by putting the credential in a password vault. So a lot of these um, Qualys and Nessus and Rapid7 have the ability to pull a credential out of a vault. And that way you can rotate that credential and limit the risk of having a root similar credential out there doing the scanning. Uh, you perform the unauthenticated scans um, on the perimeter and you know, internet facing services. And then you perform authenticated scans pretty much everywhere. Uh, so looks like it took a minute for this slide to update. I'm gonna have to pay better attention to that. I don't wanna be talking two slides ahead or one slide ahead. Um, all right, next up. Uh, public versus internal. So you need to separate, have separate scanning profiles for each set of network services and endpoints. So the public IP footprint needs to be scanned from what I call a non-privileged location, external to the organization, uh, in order to achieve a realistic assessment of the internet facing services and endpoints. Uh, if you do something you know, that's inside your network, it's privileged and it could show access to things that are actually blocked you know, in the real world uh, to bad people. Uh, for the internal networks, a shared services network segment uh, is usually needed to be architected with access to all of the other environments and network segments. Or you put a scanning appliance in your prod segment and then another one in your non-prod segments that can talk to the QA and dev servers. 
Um, and you'll have different credentials uh, for each because uh, you don't want to share credentials uh, across uh, environments uh, in order to mitigate what we call the blast radius uh, of a compromise of that credential, for example. And you can also score, uh, store, sorry, um, uh, the authenticated user might come in and just call it, you know, the uh, Qualys user. And then it would have to run sudo in order to level up to read some of the root level permissions. So you don't necessarily want your scanner user coming in as a root, right? You want to come in as a named user, use the normal privilege escalation technique. So you actually have to store the SSH key or password for the Qualys user or Nessus or whoever, Rapid7 and then also store the um, passphrase, right, for it to sudo and level up uh, and become root uh, and not really be root, but have root level permissions to, to look at all the things to know what's installed and what are the configurations. Uh, then full versus partial, like I said, depending on how much time you have in a weekly or daily maintenance window, scanning all IP addresses for TCP and UDP on all ports from zero to 65,535 takes time. Some production environments can't be scanned during business hours. So a partial scan for the common ports, like I mentioned, are used uh, and uh, to provide at least minimal coverage and observability of any new listeners that might start up, right? Rogue infrastructure by developers or rogue infrastructure from bad guys, because uh, they can set up you know, persistent remote access uh, potentially putting up a, a new listener on port 8000 or 8080 or even 88 or 81. All sorts of ports are used, you know, um, in in uh, web shells um, trying to get uh, uh, persist their remote access to your environment after compromising it. And then, of course, there's something called um, discovery scans. And so you do a subnet of full scans, allowing you to identify, like I said, rogue devices that are showing up brand new IP addresses that have been allocated that you haven't seen before. Uh, you need to be able to run discovery scans as well. And agents versus pollers, most organizations will require a combination of agent-based scanning and poll-based scanning. So having a scanner appliance reach out to the devices is one approach, but increasingly the best way to do that, as I mentioned, is to install an agent, which then pushes the uh, results of the server to the server instead of them being pulled by the polar. All right, next up. Uh, severity ratings. Severity ratings in many information security school tools are scaled from one to five, uh, where five uh, is the most critical. Uh, other systems like nuclear war threat levels referred to as DEFCON or defense readiness condition uh, are the reverse actually, where DEFCON one is maximum alert and readiness and DEFCON 5 uh, is normal uh, or peacetime readiness. As you can see here, the, uh, the matrix of impact and probability is your basic you know, risk um, uh, dimensions. And so something that's very high likely probability and very high impact would get a five, right? Unacceptable risk. Uh, and then you have two flavors of, of highs. You, know, you might call that extreme or critical, right? Uh, in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, then highs, mediums, and then lows. And uh, you can bump up or down the severity of a particular risk. It'll get its sort of raw score. And then you as the InfoSec team uh, will decide uh, some of these risks are mitigated by other factors like having a web application firewall or having good endpoint protection that can mitigate you know, threats and, and isolate them uh, or other techniques that are used to mitigate risk. So you can actually bump down the severity or the probability of it happening uh, because you have other mitigating controls. And then you change your SLA matrix as to how quickly you need to remediate them based on that modified score. So how do you quantify high risk? Uh, it's not always possible to have everyone agree on what risks are high, 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 uh, and therefore critical. Um, if there are mitigating controls, then a SEV5 vulnerability might be downgraded to a SEV4. Uh, to help with this, the InfoSec community has developed what's called CVSS. And uh, we've talked about this a little bit before, but I'll go into it again since that's the topic uh, this week for the lecture. CVSS is the Common Vulnerability Scoring System. It's an open framework for communicating the characteristics and severity of software vulnerabilities. Uh, remember, CVSS does not measure risk, it measures severity. When the base metrics are assigned and applied by an analyst, the base CVSS equation computes to a score ranging from 0.0, .0 to 10.0. Uh, CVSS version 3.1 was released in June of 2019 and consists of three metric groups actually. 
uh, base, temporal, and environmental. The um, EPSS I'm going to talk about in a minute um, is, is interesting. It was conceived out of a recognition by experienced security practitioners and researchers that current methods for assessing the risk of software vulnerabilities are based on limited information that is, for the most part, uninformed by real-world empirical data. Uh, for example, while CVSS is capturing the immutable characteristics of a vulnerability in order to communicate a measure of severity, it has been misunderstood and misapplied as a measure of risk. In some sense, however, this could have been expected because humans actually suffer from many cognitive biases, uh, which cause us to apply basic heuristics in order to manage complex decisions. And this craving for a simplistic representation of information security risk is often sat satiated when we're presented with a single number ranging from zero to 10. Uh, but I'll talk about uh, EPSS in a minute. Um, but first, uh, CVS scores can all be mapped um, to qualitative ratings defined um, as so. Uh, none is a 0, 0.0, low is 0. 0.1 to 3.9, medium is 4.0 to 6.9, high is the range from 7.0 to 8.9, and critical vulns, uh, basically high likelihood, high impact, uh, are from a 9.0 to a 10.0. A remediation matrix uh, should be published for every InfoSec team that documents the SLA the service level agreement of the engineering and infrastructure team to remediate specific CVSS scores or ratings with a specific amount of time and for which a vendor has released a fix, right? You can't patch something for which the vendor hasn't released an update for. Um, but basically, some other form of workaround or mitigation, you know, could be applied potentially uh, until the actual patch is available. So typically, lots of people would put, you know, sev 5 on an internet facing asset uh, as 24 hours. Um, non-production sev fives, you get more time, right? Because it's not production. Uh, Non-internet facing, again, another sort of um, mediating effect um, that can give you more time in your SLA to, to fix that update. Because uh, you're basically asking people to drop what they were working on once the scanning reveals there's a vulnerability uh, or your you know, you know, software dependency scanning tools reveal you know, that you need to update some packages. Uh, there's multiple sources for, for vulnerability management, of course. Uh, uh, so let's talk about CVSS base in the CVSS 3.1 uh, release uh, and nomenclature. So CVSS base represents uh, the intrinsic qualities of a vulnerability that are constant over time and across user environments. So that means it doesn't matter today or a month from now, same base score. And it doesn't matter if it's prod, QA, dev, sandbox. Uh, the vulnerability base scores is, is still the same. The temporal dimension uh, reflects the characteristics of a vulnerability that do change over time. So an example of a factor that changes over time would be the appearance of exploit code, right? Suddenly the vulnerability, the temporal score will go up once someone actually releases or discovers exploit code in the wild or a proof of concept code from a threat researcher. Uh, and then, of course, CVSS environmental, this group represents the characteristics of a vulnerability that are unique to a user's environment. So the environmental metric group includes three security requirement metrics, uh, our basic triad that we've talked about um, a few times, right? Confidentiality, integrity, availability. Um, I like to call it AIC, other people call it CIA, but those are your basic um, requirements. All right, so let's talk about uh, EPSS. This was a fun one that I learned about uh, a couple of years ago uh, from Kenna Security. Um, it was a white paper, I believe, Michael Reutemann and others presented it uh, at Black Hat in 2019. Uh, EPSS uses objective public source data. Um, it, they've identified basically 16 significant variables for a CVSS, for a CVE, uh, out of a uh, potentially 3,000 or so available variables. Uh, so basically they took public source data uh, and to accurately predict whether hackers will exploit a vulnerability within the next 12 months. So think of it as like um, a weather report, right? EPSS, Exploit Prediction Scoring System. Uh, and some of the folks that worked on this uh, white paper and that work at Kenna worked on the actual CVSS um, scoring system as well. So it's not um, a challenge to it, it's a, an improvement on it essentially. 
they found um, by buying data for breaches and exploits and vulnerabilities and scanning uh, to sort of analyze it, that only between two and 5% of vulnerabilities are ever exploited in the wild. So the industry's strategy for patching ought to reflect this. So Michael Reutemann, R-O-Y-T-M-A-N, uh, presented this white paper in Black Hat 2019. And I saw him actually speak at the New York um, Cyber Guild meetup in November of, of 2019. Uh, this helps with the resource shortage that we're seeing, right? Um, in the infosec space. Um, you don't have to patch all your vulns, just go after the two to 5% that are ever gonna be exploited. And uh, the fact that lots of organizations have tens of thousands of vulnerabilities, uh, it helps them you know, uh, focus on what's important uh, because they have little hope of patching all of them you know, anytime soon. Uh, there's a link to the uh, EPSS website and the Black Hat um, uh, paper uh, can also be found on the uh, Kenna Security blog, uh, which is in the slide notes. Actually, I might as well copy this one into the chat for you now if you want to. Uh, bookmark it for later. All right, so let's talk about EPSS a little bit more. Um, EPSS attempts to identify using machine learning analysis, which critical vulns are most likely to see exploit code developed in the coming 12 months. So this is looking to the future. Uh, so this image was taken from their Black Hat presentation. Um, Jay Jacobs, uh, chief data scientist from the Scientia Institute, and Michael Reutemann, uh, from, chief data scientist from Kenna Security. Based on their research, about half of firms are falling behind. Uh, remediation of vulns is slower than the rate at which new vulnerabilities are discovered and published. Uh, a small one-sixth of firms are actually treading water and keeping up with the rate of new vulnerabilities as they're um, as they're uh, published. And uh, a third of firms are actually gaining ground, either by removing systems and software, because uh, deleting or decommissioning a system is a perfectly good approach to remediating a vulnerability. Uh, and we in InfoSec prefer people to decommission legacy things that need to be patched, um, either by removing the system or the software or patching to the latest stable and secure versions. Automation is a key ingredient in those organizations, of course. Uh, the ones that are swimming faster than the current and gaining ground on their attack surface. So the conclusion here is that patching for what are called true positives for critical and high where exploit code exists or will soon exist is the best application of, of limited resources. Uh, it seems terribly obvious, but most organizations take a purely quantitative approach to vulnerability management metrics and just report on the total number of vulns instead of the ones that are actually impactful or exploitable. Uh, diving into their paper a little bit further, it was interesting to note that the strongest indicator, which would be the number one variable out of the 16 variables that were strongly correlated, right, which are listed on the right, of exploit code, was the appearance of vendor equals Microsoft, uh, which makes intuitive sense to me. Um, it might well simply be an indicator of the dominance of the OS in a target-rich industries like financial services, but it's also interesting to posit that the single most effective decision that a company can make to improve their risk of data breach, where 99% of all breaches leverage exploits, you know, which for which there's existing proof of concept code, would be to limit the use of Microsoft software and Microsoft operating systems. So if you have a choice to run a Tomcat or an Apache web server on Windows or Linux, run it on Linux. It'll make your life easier. Um, and of course, everyone that's using Exchange now instead of you know, Exchange Online or G Suite or other tools uh, are feeling that pain of that decision as well. Or maybe a lack of decision, which would be the lack of deciding to move off of it and to move into a cloud-based um, mail system. I mean, when you think about it, email is not, almost, it's almost nobody's core competency. So why do you have to staff a team of like two or three, you know, Exchange engineers to keep it running and patching and, you know, sizing and scaling? And, all of that when you can just outsource it. Uh, there's only a few companies whose email is their core you know, sweet spot, and that would be people like Microsoft and Gmail and, and others. Anyway, so the model, regardless of what, comp what comprises your application stack, the model offers the ability to focus your efforts. For CVSS 9 plus, nines and tens, right? Um, regression analysis of CVEs reduced the effort from 813 CVEs 
to just 181. So that was 78% just for this uh, kind of analysis, right? And while maintaining 25% coverage of exploited CVEs. So that's that's not bad, right? And then if you go to CBSS 7 and higher, right? Which I think if we jump back, um, CBSS 7, um, that's uh, your highs and criticals, right? Everyone just basically you know, focuses on highs and criticals. Um, if we move back here and say seven and higher, um, yep. the model actually reduces effort from 2,700 CVEs that you have to attack to 1,100. Uh, so that's 61%. And it's maintaining 63% coverage of exploited CVEs. Uh, so anyway, this was fascinating, I think, you know, to. Uh, um, see this uh, machine learning and uh, copyrighted uh, proprietary data that was purchased of breach events and uh, incidents and uh, um, forensic investigations combined with what they could observe by the keywords that are used in all these vulnerabilities uh, is that the number one thing you can do to make your infrastructure stronger is to not run it on Windows. Uh, that's of course changing over time. Generalizations you know, don't always hold forever, um, but certainly that's been my experience. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about some scanning tools. Uh, I think I have a couple of slides left and then we'll go into uh, InfoSec and the news because there's plenty of news to discuss this week on this topic. Uh, some scanning tools, uh, Qualys, Nessus, Rapid7, OpenVAS, um, and Secubus. Uh, there are plenty of more tools out there than just these, but these are some of the ones that I've used. And I included a plug from my friend and former colleague here, uh, Frank Bredijk, uh, the original author and lead developer uh, for Secubus. Secubus is a great, uh, because it actually automates scanning uh, using other tools uh, like um, Nictu and uh, Nessus. And uh, it provides what I, what's called Delta reporting. So it allows you to suppress some of the findings so that you can focus only on the issues that you actually plan to remediate. And so uh, Frank uh, and I used to work together when I was uh, in Holland, uh, in Amsterdam, uh, working in a company called Schubert Phyllis. And so I wanted to provide a plug for him here as well, because he's still uh, the chief information security officer there and doing a great job uh, protecting the infrastructure that uh, Schubert Phyllis builds for its customers and uh, helping the world do a better job of managing their security vulnerabilities uh, by uh, publishing Secubus. Uh, let's see, uh, vulnerability metrics, uh, remediation matrix, uh, criticals, you know, SEV4, SEV5 typically, um, exploitable vulns, top 10 vulns. Uh, this is a particular view, I think, of a Qualys dashboard, right? Um, and I took this off the internet, so this is not uh, any infrastructure that I've maintained, so you're not gaining anything uh, uh, about uh, proprietary uh, knowledge of, of places uh, that I've worked. Uh, but now it's time to put some process around all of these tools and uh, establish some KPIs, right? Some key performance indicators. And so, are you hitting your remediation matrix, your SLA? Um, how many criticals and uh, highs do you have? How many of those are exploitable and what are the top 10? So let's zoom into an example dashboard for Qualys, uh, although the views for Nessus and other tools would look pretty similar. So what if we wanna focus on is the remediation of the exploitables and the critical bones. Ideally, you wanna have an integration to your patching software like SCCM or BigFix or something similar like that so that they can build the patch set based on the scan results, right? This is a logical integration of two tools that might be in your arsenal. Automation here is pretty key. And so I would think that uh, you know, more of these organizations should be working in this direction where you run a scan and then the scan generates an artifact. That artifact can then be used to build a patch set and apply it to your servers. And remember, you have to reply it in most places, you know, dev first, then QA, then maybe UAT uh, and then production, because you need to give it a time to burn in, as they say, uh, to make sure that there's no breaking changes um, or you know fallout from, from the security update, unexpected uh, or, or otherwise. And so you can't just sort of roll out all your production updates uh, and non-production updates on the same day. That's a little bit of a recipe for, for trouble uh, and having to roll back some of your um, updates essentially. Oh, and that's one other thing I should mention real quick. When you are doing this um, vulnerability management and you are patching and updating and then scanning, obviously schedule your scan for after your patches, right? Um, maybe scan before and see how many you closed, but 
generally they keep track of how many uh, vulnerabilities are closed and how many are reopened. Uh, and that's an interesting metric. If you see a vulnerability that's reopened, that means that you're probably minting fresh, you know, elastic compute, for example, that doesn't have a patched update or image, right? A golden image uh, for a container or for a, 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 an operating system. And that can be, you know, or ought to be a sign of immaturity uh, because you don't want to be deploying vulnerable infrastructure and then 24 hours later, potentially providing a system update, right? For unattended um, uh, patching and updates. You want to make sure that the golden image is being patched so that every new piece of infrastructure you deploy doesn't have this in immediate vulnerability window in which it could be attacked. Um, and that's definitely the case for a lot of uh, organizations that haven't got that sequence down. Uh, the other thing, experience tells me is that you should probably reboot a Windows machine like twice or three times uh, as part of a patching cycle. So you may need to reboot it once just to clear any weird state that's in position. You know, let's say you do this once a week and you have a maintenance window for all of your servers and it's not all at the same time. Certainly two nodes of a cluster, you don't want them both going down at the same time. And you do a preemptive reboot. Um, what I found is that more Windows updates apply and get installed successfully if you reboot prior to installing the patches. Uh, just to sort of clear any strange, you know, state on the registry or on the Windows or different objects, you know, that are part of uh, um, of the of the operating system, any artifacts, any, any memory leaks that might be running, things like that. Then you apply the updates and then you reboot again. Uh, so that's at least two. Sometimes a third reboot is needed because there's another patch that depended on an earlier patch. And so uh, when in doubt, um, schedule three reboots for every maintenance window for a Windows machine. Uh, Pre-patch reboot and then two reboots after applying the updates, just to make sure they all get applied. Um, that was certainly a, a lesson learned over time. Uh, let's see, what else? Kali Linux. Um, over 600 tools. Uh, and in terms of vulnerability management, you know, it's an active community, it's free, lots of extensive tutorials. Hopefully you're somewhat familiar with it because we're going to do a little bit with it in this course. Uh, but I don't try to go too far because that's not really the goal. It's just to make sure that you're familiar with it and some of its tools. Um, Kali Linux is maintained and funded by Offensive Security. Uh, it's highly evolved digital forensics and pen testing tools and environment. The Kali Linux project began quietly in 2012 when offensive security decided that they wanted to replace their venerable backtrack Linux project, uh, which was manually maintained uh, with something that become that could become a genuine Debian derivative, complete with all of the required infrastructure and improved packaging techniques. So the decision was made to build Kali on top of the Debian distribution because it's well known for its quality, stability, and, and wide selection of available software. And uh, what's interesting, of course, is that if you run Windows subsystem Linux on your Windows 10 or Windows servers, you can actually get a Kali Linux distribution installed through the Microsoft Store. So for me, that's a great um, indication that Microsoft's, you know, smart and uh, doing the right thing. And, uh, you know, getting developers, you know, to work on a Windows system, subsystem Linux means that it's not uh, an emulated Linux, uh, like my someone might do with a virtual box, right? And to run a virtual Linux machine on a Windows machine. This is actually native binary integration with the file system. Uh, but uh, then you might actually have thought, or at least I know I thought that you're creating a bit of a honeypot OS, right? Because it has all the vulnerabilities of Windows and it has all the vulnerabilities of Linux. And so now you're asking IT teams, you know, to maintain a, a software repository for two OSs. Um, but generally that was probably part of your application stack anyway. And so it's not a you know, huge lift uh, to at least have one Debian based right for Windows subsystem Linux and then uh, one for Windows, depending on what type of code you're developing. Um, not uh, withstanding my advice to not run Windows if you can avoid it, of course. Uh, and then Kali Linux, um, these are the top 25 packages. Um, definitely spend some time reading up and looking at them and checking them out and learning how to use them. Uh, there's plenty of you know great tutorials available, uh, and the top 25 tools includes Nmap, uh, Netcat, uh, Unicorn Scan, Fierce, OpenBaz, Nikto, as I mentioned, WP Scan. That's a WordPress scanner. Uh, I've used that many times to point out vulnerabilities to people that are running web uh, WordPress sites. Uh, CMS Map for content management systems, uh, Fluxion, Aircraft, 
Aircraft Kismet, Wireless, Wireshark, John the Ripper for crunching uh, uh, passwords, I think it is, if I remember correctly. THC Hydra, Find My Hash, Rainbow Crack, which uses rainbow tables to get it uh, um, uh, hashes of passwords. The Metasploit, flame, uh, Metasploit Framework, Social Engineering Toolkit, SET, as it's called. Um, BE, EF, yeah, I don't remember that one actually. Uh, Yersinia, DHCP, PIG, uh, Funk Load, Slow, HTTP Test, uh, Inundator 250, all sorts of lovely tools that are part of the, the Kali package and stats. All right, so that has taken us to the end of the slides for this uh, lecture. So time to swap over to a full desktop share. And I don't think I need to include music. I don't think any of the sites will have audio that we have to check out. Um, but let's uh, take a look at InfoSec in the news. And of course, like I said, there's plenty of stories um, flowing right now uh, related to vulnerability management. Uh, let's see, how to customize your Windows 10 desktop tools. No, that's just customization. Overview from Malware Bender. Gives you the best of the internet in one place. Microsoft CSX Exchange. Uh, this was um, IOC detection tool. Yeah, this is something you should be playing around with uh, if you haven't looked at it. Um, here it is. This is the GitHub repo. Um, so basically, you can run these PowerShell scripts because it's published by Microsoft, and you can see uh, information about, you know, what, 17 hours ago it was updated and uh, they have a proxy logon security script. You download this PowerShell script and you get the exchange server and it checks to see, uh, looks for you know, whether Hafnium um, has been uh, on your system. And uh, the backend cookie mitigation, you can run this and it basically stops the malicious um, headers uh, being abused for, let me stop this here, um, X anon resource backend and a malformed um, XBE resource cookies that are used. Uh, and then there's this last one here. Uh, this one's handy because you can do this one from anywhere. You don't have to run it from an exchange server. Um, you, this is uh, to be used with Nmap. So it's an N Nmap script. Um, and it detects whether the specified URL um, is vulnerable to the exchange um, SSRF, which is one of the four vulnerabilities. So imagine if, if one of them is present, I imagine all four are going to be present. And you can look at the script here. Um, let's see, I have it downloaded. And uh, just to see if you've never run an Nmap script before, uh, it shows you how to do that. Um, so it says what uh, usage nmap dash p and then dash dash script and then the name of this script and then the target. So that could be a host name or an IP address. And if it's vulnerable, it'll come back with something like this. It'll say output port 443 is open, it's running HTTPS service, and it is vulnerable. And so that's your way of flagging it. And then after you patch for it, it should run it again and it should come back as not vulnerable. But what does it actually do? Um, besides having a description that says, okay, exchange version 2013 below 15, uh, whatever, whatever, and exchange 16 below cumulative update 18, right? So this is sort of telling you which versions um, you may be running uh, that are vulnerable. Uh, and then a little bit further down here is the interesting bit, right? So this is where it's basically looking at um, Outlook Web Access auth, and it's looking at x.js. It's doing a get. Um, and then it's doing a local host um, ECP default filter tilde three and sending an X header. Um, so basically it's setting a cookie and it can tell based on the cookie response, if the status response is not 500, meaning server error, uh, then it was able to negotiate the security context. And therefore the vulnerability of the thing you're looking at is true. And so it return, returns the value of nothing and just says it's scanned uh, or it pops back and says, oh yeah, you haven't patched for this vulnerability yet. Uh, so that's cool, right? Information sharing. Uh, that's how we all keep ourselves um, safe. Uh, yeah. So downloading this Nmap script, uh, if you don't have Nmap, you can download it uh, part of your Kali Linux distribution or download it to your Mac and install it with Brew. Uh, on Windows, you can install it as well and you get a command line or a GUI to run these things. But the command line stuff, I of course um, prefer. Uh, so let me throw this into the chat as well, just for safekeeping, because it goes into the 
archives of the, uh, of the lecture. And if we jump back to our friend here, Slack. Um, so anyway, that was a useful thing to share. Um, new Microsoft tool checks exchange servers for proxy logon hacks, um, which is talking exactly about what we were looking at. Uh, those PowerShell scripts are the ones that query for it. Basically, it's creating uh, ASPX files inside of your INET pub folder for the IIS instance that's a part of your front end instances for Exchange. Uh, let's see, securing your AWS S3 pre signed URLs. No. Ransomware gang plans to call victims' business partners about the attacks. Uh, the Revol ransomware operation announced this week that they're using DDoS and voice calls to journalists and victims' business partners to generate ransom payments. Uh, so this is a heightened um, extortion uh, technique. Um, this is certainly vulnerability management, I guess, uh, related. So this ransomware gang plans to call the victims' business partners about the attacks. So let's see. Uh, also known as um, SodaNokiB as uh, ransomware as a service. They developed the malware and payment site. Yeah, I think we talked about this once already. Um, ransomware as a service is actually developing customer support kind of functionality, right? They want to maximize the return on investment. They don't want to install ransomware on somebody's workstation or on a law firm's computer where the IT guy doesn't even understand what Bitcoin is. And there are people many of them that don't want to know what Bitcoin is, uh, let alone, you know, trade in it or, or you know, speculate. Um, and so they wouldn't get paid, right? If the IT person that they go to does not do it, or they don't go to an outside forensics firm to try to deal with it. Uh, so basically they build uh, customer support portals and you actually see people going in chat windows, you know, like you're opening up a trouble ticket, you know, with your um, internet provider and saying, you know, my router is not working and you call them up and they walk through a script. Same kind of thing is happening with ransomware now, actually, because uh, they want to, you know, negotiate a good price to get paid more often than not. So sometimes they'll do a discount if you, you know, buy now or buy the decryption key now. And they, of course, you know, need to maintain the equivalent of a Yelp profile, right, for being uh, a reputable ransomware uh, entity that allows you to decrypt your data after it's been captured and, and ransomed. Uh, so anyway, that's part of the uh, um, service um, and maturity of these sophisticated outfits. Uh, let's see, today a security researcher known as 3xport discovered Revil has announced that they were introducing new tactics that affiliates can use to exert even more pressure on victims. So Revil is providing a paid service that allows affiliates to perform layer three and layer seven DDoS attacks against the company for maximum pressure. What does it say? Uh, DDoS is paid, calls and spam are free for adverts of our PP. Um, what is PP? Uh, paid program or something? Anyway, um, I also remind you about the development uh, polymorphic engine. Uh, one place to take red team, one network providers, one team of network workers experience required maximum rate work directly. So that was a forum posting announcing their new extortion features. Uh, a layer three attack is commonly used to take down a company's internet connection. In contrast, threat actors would use a layer seven to take down a publicly accessible application such as a web server. In October, we reported that SunCrypt and Ragnar Locker ransomware operations have begun to use DDoS attacks uh, to try to get them to pay. So just combining the ransomware and a DDoS, because uh, often you can get out of jail by just using a backup, right? Restoring from backup, you don't have to pay the ransom. So the DDoS attack is just an additional factor, I guess, that they're throwing in on top to maximize their profit, right? Because remember, bad guys, it's a business. They have limited resources. They want to get the most money they can out of it as well. Uh, check to see if you're vulnerable to exchange server zero days using this tool. It's probably the same thing that we looked at a minute ago. Uh, Windows 10 inches closer to release. No, not today's story. Samsung fixes critical Android bugs in March 2021 updates. That's definitely related to today's topic. Um, let's see. Fi Samsung fixes critical Android bugs in their updates this week. Remember, it's not just Android that has to fix things because Samsung add packages and software on top of Android, right? And they have an OEM, uh, original equipment manufacturer, uh, distribution of Pi or Oreo. So this week they started rolling out Android's March security updates to its mobile devices, right? So it takes time between when Android releases the update and Samsung packages it for their versions with their special customizations and implementations. 
uh, to patch critical vulns in the runtime operating system and related components. This comes after Android had published their March 2021 updates bullet, which includes patches for critical vulnerabilities. Uh, as observed by bleeping computer, Samsung devices are automatically pulling updates released on March 5th, 2021 this week. Uh, these updates mainly comprise significant security fixes with a couple of enhancements across Samsung Galaxy built-in apps like calendar, display, social platform, and smart things. Uh, every vulnerability addressed in this update is either a high or critical, making this update a must for Android users so that their devices remain protected. Uh, from RCE via Bluetooth to privilege escalation. So there's a critical vulnerability, uh, 2021-0397, lurking in the Android system arising from a null pointer, which has been fixed by this update. The vulnerability in Bluetooth's, Android's Bluetooth discovery protocol implementation called Fluoride Bluetooth Stack could let an attacker perform remote code execution attacks via a specially crafted Bluetooth transmission. So what's your mitigation here is to turn Bluetooth off uh, when you're not using it. Uh, so that it can't be uh, attacked in this way. Uh, additionally, Google Play Protect has stepped up protections and made exploitation of Android volumes more challenging by adding security enhancements. Um, exploitation for many issues in Android is made more difficult by enhancements in newer versions of Android, like Pi. But as we saw, not everyone's running it. Um, we encourage all users to update uh, where possible. So what does this mean if you can't? Technically, you should probably get rid of the device. Um, uh, and uh, recycle it, uh, or, you know, I guess you could donate it potentially, but you're not really making the world a safer place by just giving the vulnerable old phone to someone else. Um, but yeah, it makes us feel bad sometimes, I guess, where we buy something and it's obsoleted. But that's sort of the way the Android system and the market is working at the moment. Uh, other flaws uh, impacting components like framework system and Android runtime could allow sensitive information disclosure by privilege escalation by hackers. So here's a bunch of lists of uh, the runtimes and the frameworks and the CVEs. These are probably the Samsung links. Maybe though this is actually the Google link. Um, and then uh, Android version, so 8.1. I think, what was that? You know, oh, Android 10 and 11 are available now as well. Um, some bugs may still be exploitable. On select ga Samsung Galaxy devices, the updates published this week have their latest security patch level dated 2021-0301. This implies the high and critical vulnerabilities yet to be fixed by the 305 security patch could still be exploitable. Uh, so even though you've patched to the latest version, you may still not be safe. Um, and so, you know, what is your choice? You know, stop using the Samsung phone, uh, maybe, um, uh, or you know, add some uh, antivirus type tools to it that are behavioral based, right? Because uh, if you can't patch the vuln, you can at least potentially be aware of it. Uh, being exploited uh, by the bad guys. All right, let's see what else is in the stories of the week. Um, blah, blah, blah. Additional mitigations. Yeah, this one was interesting because obviously you want to patch, but not everyone can patch immediately. So when I saw this story, I thought it was really good um, that they had come up with an additional technique uh, for mitigating if you can't patch. Uh, and that was where I talked about the uh, rewrite rule right uh for iis and so i think this one is the blog post uh well no sorry this is the velocity story so this one's good to hit because uh these are the first people that detected it right march 2nd um let's see in january through its network monitoring service they detected anomalous activity from two customers exchange servers velocity <laughs> identified a large amount of data being sent to IP address it believed that were not tied to legitimate users. A closer inspection of the IIS logs, the web server logs from the exchange server revealed rather alarming results. The logs showed inbound post requests to valid files associated with images, JavaScript and cascading style sheets and fonts used by Outlook Web Access. It was initially suspected the servers might be backdoored and that web shells were being executed through a malicious HTTP module. As a result, its incident response efforts acquired system memory, basically doing a memory dump, right, of the system. And if you don't know how to run a memory dump, make sure you know how to. You can do full and partial memory dumps uh, and actual process-based memory dumps uh, to create some artifacts and investigate forensic investigation. Uh, this investigation revealed that the servers were not backdoored and uncovered a zero-day exploit being used in the wild. Uh, they got backdoored later, I'm sure. Uh, 
through its analysis of system memory, they determined the attacker was exploiting a zero-day server-side request forgery vulnerability. So server-side request forgery means when the server you're talking to, you can convince it to do something on a backend system that you can't even reach and do a query and extract data and pull it back and then punt the data back out to you. So that's why it's called server-side request forgery. Um, and there's other ways of just simply exploiting the device you can talk to. But in this case, it's going and talking to the back end, you know, CAS servers, uh, and you might be hitting one of the front ends uh, for the exchange platform. The attacker was using the vulnerability to steal contents of several user mailboxes. This vulnerability is remotely exploitable and does not require authentication of any kind, nor does it require any special knowledge or access to a target environment. So in our CVSS example, this would be um, the base score would be really high because it's remote code execution pre-authentication. Uh, then of course, seeing it in the wild, the environmental and temporal scales are both gonna go way up um, because Exchange is typically a production environment tool, um, although they could be hacking your you know, non-production Exchange uh, environments, but there's probably not as interesting emails in there. Uh, but they exfiltrate um, adjust books, uh, emails, um, Obviously, phishing becomes a lot more successful if you can send an authenticated valid email from a third party to their contacts with a payload in it, right? You get past all of the spam uh, kind of uh, filters uh, that might be in place because it's coming from a trusted third party, right? BEC, business email compromise. Uh, so let's see, it doesn't require any vulnerabilities. So additionally, Velocity is providing alternative mitigations um, if you have an F5 load balancer in front of it, some of the, these requests can be mitigated there. Uh, if you have the advanced WAF subscription, I think, uh, from Big IP. Uh, so they published um, a piece on this as well, talking about how that's probably a better architecture, right? Why would you put your Exchange server direct on the internet? Most people would put it behind a VPN. So you had to be on the VPN in order to check your mail, right? Uh, or at least if you're gonna put it on the internet for people to check their mail without firing up a VPN, uh, put a load balancer in front of it where you can have the opportunity to deploy lots of mitigations and controls uh, and uh, sanity scrubbing of requests. And in this case, F5 updated their libraries for you to mitigate the risk uh, ahead of time. You had to do nothing actually to stop one of these vulnerabilities if you had an F5 in front of your, uh, in front of your exchange, uh, on-prem exchange. So let's see, this vulnerability has been confirmed to exist in the latest version of Exchange 2016 and a fully patched 2016 server. Um, Veloxity also confirmed that the vulnerability exists in Exchange 2019, but is not tested against a fully patched version, but it believes it's vulnerable. Uh, following the discovery of this 26855, they continued to monitor the threat actor and work with additional impacted orgs. During the course of multiple incident response efforts, they identified the attacker had managed to chain the SSRF vulnerability with another that allows remote code execution on targeted exchange server. In all cases, Veloxity has observed the attacker writing web files, basically you know, ASPX files uh, to disk and conducting further operations to dump credentials, add user accounts, steal copies of Active Directory database and move laterally to other systems and environment. So basically you're in big doo-doo and lots of people, like I said, are losing their sleep uh, over this weekend to try to look for signs of compromise and to patch against this vulnerability, like hundreds of thousands of companies and uh, systems administrators. Uh, the patching addressing both of these vulnerabilities is expected imminently. Well, when they published this, Microsoft had come out with it as well. Uh, and then there was also an authentication bypass vulnerability. They can't provide full details because they don't want people to reproduce it and do even more bad things. Uh, but they did share some useful details surrounding the exploitation. Uh, they observed the attacker focused on getting a list of emails from a targeted mailbox, downloading them. It's possible that further improve and automate attacks in the lab environment. Uh, there's two methods to download email with this vulnerability, depending on the way that Microsoft Exchange has been configured. In corporate environments, it's common for multiple Exchange servers will be set up. So you don't know which CAS you know, uh, client app uh, access server has the particular mailbox on it. This is often done for load balancing reasons, right? While it's less common, it's also possible to run all exchange functionality on a single server, but not most corporate sizing environments, uh, in my experience. In the case where there is a single server being used, Veloxity believes that the attacker must know the targeted domain security identifier in order to access their mailbox. It's a static value and it's not considered something secret. However, it's not something that's trivially obtained by someone without access to the org. 
in a multiple server config where the servers are configured in a database availability group, a DAG, uh, Veloxity has proven an attacker does not need to acquire a user's domain SID to access mailbox. The only information required is the email address that they wish to target. Uh, so if they're harvesting all of this data and working to make sure that um, you know, they can remain persistent on the platform, uh, then I believe that would be the reason for it, right? Uh, so let's see, let's turn down the exposure a little bit, fix the white balance because we're looking a bit red and update focus. There we go. Anyway, uh, in order to exploit this, the attacker also has to identify the fully qualified domain name of the internal exchange servers. Using a series of requests, they determine that this information could be extracted by an attacker with only initial knowledge of the external address. Oh yeah, I actually found this myself um, while researching it uh, last night. Um, a specially crafted request that comes in to the auto discovery URL, if I remember correctly, uh, which is a part of any exchange setup. You actually zero out the host header and then it will decide because it doesn't know what you were looking for. It'll try to be as helpful as it can. And it will actually cough up the private IP address, the inside IP address in one of the headers that comes back from this malformed request where there's no host header. A host header is like the host name. Right? So let's say you go to an IP address and just for illustration purposes, let's say that it's um, you know, some number like 194 dot something or whatever. And it comes back with the private IP address of the exchange server on the inside, whether there's one or more of them. And so you can just do a series of these requests until it round robins through and you find out 192.168.5.1 or something and 5.2 is the inside address. So that's actually how they were able to do this X, uh, SSRF request because of a vulnerability that exposes uh, the private IP of the backend DAGs uh, basically. Uh, let's see, the folder that they're exploiting is this. Um, so if you see strange post requests showing up in here in your logs, then you know you've been compromised. Uh, this folder contains images, fonts, and cascading style sheets. Using any of these files for the post appears to allow the exploit to proceed. But if they go for an ASPX file or simply a folder like OWA, Outlook Web Access uh, Auth, uh, the exploit does not work. Uh, so that's an interesting distinction. Uh, and then here's a demonstration of the exploit, but I won't go into it. Uh, and then the following payload was used to retrieve the identifiers uh, of each email in Alice's mailbox. Uh, so fascinating. Uh, remote code execution. This one's a little bit obfuscated here because I don't want to give the whole detail. Uh, but they found out how you could talk to the um, address book, which is why they recommended turning off the um, ECP, the exchange control panel. And down here, the OAB, uh, which was for the uh, offline address book, because uh, that was also being um, abused. So that's sort of your intermediate mitigations. Uh, and then further, the observed indicators are consistent with the web server breaches. Uh, look on disk uh, and look for the presence of ASPX files in the following paths. So here is your inet pub, www.root, uh, asp.net, and then any ASPX file in the subfolder. I think I read somewhere that all of the file names are eight characters long as well. Uh, so that's certainly, um, uh, an, like I said, an indicator of compromise. All right, and let's see what else. Weblog user agents that are being used. Um, looks like they're pretending to be DuckDuck bots. Uh, they're pretending to be Mozilla coming from Baidu, from Bing and Google. So these are just forged user agent strings that are being used. Uh, and then these are some of the other ones that they found for user agents that are hitting the ECP URLs, the exchange control panel. So exchange services client 0.0.0, .0, .0 Python requests. So these are just things that you can potentially look for uh, to know whether you hit. And then finally, um, additional bot, uh, bypass indicators, and then some of the network attacker IPs are coming from these IP addresses. So if you have the ability to block these, that can help mitigate it for a while. But in general, these APTs have lots of resources available, not at just these IP addresses, but at many different ones. And so you're playing a bit of whack-a-mole if you're trying to just add a list of blacklisted IPs, because the, these could be um, uh, addresses that are part of um, you know, virtual private servers that are part of legitimate, you know, business offering from cloud service providers. So you don't necessarily want to lock them out. Um, uh, certainly if you've been exploited, you do. Um, but in the long term, you know, 
that's not a viable um, approach because a, a legitimate customer, you know, a piece of infrastructure could end up behind some of these IPs. Uh, and then lastly, um, these are some examples of uh, web shell um, code that they have seen that's showing up, um, creating tunnels and allowing people to uh, get in. So anyway, that's a bit of a dive into the current nightmare. And if you want to compare this <clears throat> to uh, the solar wind breach and the supply chain attack there, uh, this is not uh, a supply chain attack, right? This is just vulnerabilities in exchange. Um, and uh, there are zero day vulnerabilities, yes. Uh, but I would say this is about three to five times bigger um, in terms of scope, right? Because you know, this is very sensitive data, you know, and it's actively being exploited. The attackers have ramped up, you know, since it was discovered. So they've sort of, you know, dialed the put the pedal to the metal in order to capture as much of this data that they need and want, establish the web hooks, I'm uh, sorry, the web shells, and uh, download people's emails and uh, address books and, and things like that. Uh, that's probably enough on that topic. Um, Ex-CISA chief Chris Krebs tweeted, um, he said, yeah, here it was, check for eight character ASPX files in INET pub. And uh, where was that additional piece that talked about the rewrite rule? Well, anyway, I'm sure you can find it if you look for it. Uh, ways to mitigate uh, temporarily, partially until you can patch. But the best approach, of course, is to patch. All right, what else is in the news? Um, how to extract Python source code. No, it's not really vulnerability management. This week in ransomware. Targeting service providers, um, MSPs, managed security service providers, <coughs> are a good target to hit. They manage security for the people. Uh, Washington State Auditor faulted for not disclosing breach sooner. Uh, interesting. So we had talked about the Excelian FTA, right, the file transfer appliance, and I think we had looked into it and gotten a sense of, you know, the scope of that. It's pretty big. Uh, also, uh, not a supply chain attack, but um, 1.3 million Washington state residents had been affected by this breach and uh, first announced last month at one uh, that Excelion had been, and apparently they're getting um, blamed for not disclosing it uh, sooner. Interesting. Uh, software icon um, McAfee charged in cryptocurrency scam. Um, that's sort of like what uh, the soap opera of InfoSec, right? Things going on with McAfee. I don't know if we have to, uh, drill down into that right now. Um, he's uh, eccentric, I guess you could say, right, to put it uh, poorly. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, Bruce Schneier's um, squid blog is talking about a vampire squid fossil. Interesting. Uh, ransomware only decrypts victims who join their Discord server. Interesting. Hog encrypts users' devices and only decrypts them if they join the developer's Discord server. That's an interesting new development. Let's look at that real quick. Um, open link. Uh, a new ransomware called Hog encrypts devices and only decrypts them if they join their Discord server. Um, malware hunt hunter team found an in development cryptor for the Hog that requires victims to join a Discord server to decrypt their files. I wonder why they would want that. Um, I guess maybe they can apply additional exploits to you if you do that. I'm not sure. Um, viral for the ransomware, which when executed will check if a particular Discord server exists. And if it does, it begins to encrypt the victim's files. When encrypting the victim's files, it will append the .hog extension as shown below and automatically extract the decryptor component. Once the ransomware has finished encrypting the device, it will launch the decrypt my files program from the Windows start folder. The decryptor will explain what happened uh, and prompt them to enter their Discord user token. Uh, okay. The Discord token allows the ransomware to authenticate to Discord's APIs as the user to check if they join their server as shown in the code below. If the victim has joined the server or the server does not exist, it will decrypt the victim's files using a static key embedded in the ransomware. While this appears to be an in-developed ransomware, it does illustrate how threat actors are beginning to use Discord more for malicious activities. Okay, so that's not really a professional presentation combination. 
maybe they're just testing out, you know, the ability to use Discord as a user verification technique. Um, Discord is commonly used by threat actors to distribute malware or harvest stolen data. As the threat actor turns to Discord, it's critical for administrators and network security tools to monitor Discord traffic threats and abnormal behavior. Makes sense. Um, Microsoft Exchange hits retail government education. Oh, I think there was another one that was about um, the airline industry getting hit with uh, um, an attack. I think we'll try to find that story. Microsoft adopted an aggressive strategy in sharing SolarWinds attack intel. That's good for all of us. DoD weapons programs lack key cybersecurity measures. Oof. That's definitely vulnerability management. Management. Um, what does this one say? DoD weapons program lacks key cybersecurity measures. Uh, the lack of cybersecurity requirements on weapons contracts from the Department of Defense opens the door for dangerous attacks. Uh, weapons programs used for the Department of Defense are falling short. These contracts are awarded to various manufacturers, massive contractors. 60% um, of contracts included zero requirements when it comes to cybersecurity protection measures. Wow. A government accountability office is sort of the watchdog for some of these things, right? Like, are you doing your job? Are you putting in the right contract language? If 60% of the contracts have no security requirements, that's horrible. Uh, let's see, GAO is an independent nonpartisan, blah, blah, blah. Specifically, they can be included in all the contracts, but they haven't been met. Weapons contracts. When it comes to security, weapons contracts should define requirements to satisfy the needs of the agency. However, the majority of them did not include cybersecurity requirements at all. Security risks, interesting key recommendations. Moving forward, three recommendations, each suggesting that the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps provide better guidance on how programs should incorporate tailored cybersecurity requirements into contracts. DOD required, not concurred with two recommendations and stated that the third to the Marine Corps should be merged into one with the Navy. Okay, hopefully they take that. That good advice. Uh, so there is the one about the uh, airlines being attacked. Uh, WordPress injection anchors widespread malware campaign. Obviously, WordPress was discussed today. We can spend a minute on it as well, just to see what the latest WordPress pain is. Um, injection. Website admins should patch all plugins, Word itself, WordPress itself, and backend servers as soon as possible. The downloader malware known as Goat Goop Loader is poisoning websites globally as a part of an extensive drive by and watering hole campaign that abuses WordPress sites by injecting with hundreds of pages of fake content. The adversaries have so far delivered the Cobalt Strike Intrusion Tool, Goot Kit, Banking Trojan, or the e Revil Ransomware, according to forensic analysis. Uh, researchers at East Centire. Oh, I've worked with them before. Um, I actually gave a presentation to them uh, a couple of years ago for their sales teams about uh, vendor relationship management. Anyway, spotted Gootloader campaign in December, infiltrating dozens of legitimate websites. The threat actor's game is to infect business professionals speaking English, German, and Korean. Uh, their modus operandi is to entice business professionals to one of the compromised sites, have them click on a link, uh, which attempts to retrieve the final payload, whether it be ransomware, banking trojan, or otherwise. Watering hole attacks, um, the performing incident response. Uh, E-Centaur analysts saw malicious code being written to the Windows registry, uh, a fileless malware tech attack. Upon further investigation, the inve infection turned out to be stemmed from an employee who was searching the internet for sample business agreements dealing with physician assistants practicing medicine in California. So they probably downloaded a Word doc that had a macro or malware in it, right? Because they wanted to find a template uh, the employee found top-ranked web page purporting to be a Q&A forum, um, but when the person attempted to open the so-called document, it executed goot loader. <coughs> mm. In another incident, an employee of a consulting firm was searching the web for the Paris Agreement, the International Treaty on Climate Change. So it looks like they're gaming the search engines by getting a whole bunch of um, search engine optimization and ranking from owning certain keywords and then using WordPress sites that have been compromised uh, to push it out. So this one's not any particular WordPress vulnerability. They're just saying WordPress plays into it in this campaign of, of putting up a bunch of sites that gets them search engine higher rankings, uh, SEO as it's called. 
All right, so that's that. Let's get rid of that. Let's go back to here and see if we can find the airlines. Yeah, here's the story. Um, doo -doo -doo. The uh, vulnerabilities and exploits and breaches are coming so fast and furious these days. A lot of people are worried that people don't have enough time to sleep, right? The incident response teams are losing a lot of rest um, because multiple attacks are running at the same time. And you know, you need to keep someone uh, out of the incident response so that they can take over, right? After 12 hours or something like that, right? Make sure you have a rotation scheme <clears throat> built into your incident response so that you um, can stay fresh, right? And not have the whole team get burned out all at once. So you need to have shifts of incident response. Uh, anyway, so for, for vulnerability management, um, there's an attack on CETA, which is the uh, airline services provider for passenger information systems. And so that was what was compromised. Uh, the company spokeswoman told ThreatPost PSS operates a system for processing airline passenger data and belongs to a group of CETA companies headquartered in the EU. So that means GDPR is going to be all over this one with fines. And who's going to get fined? Um, CETA will get fined. But also all of the airlines that use CETA will get fined because they're responsible for maintaining the confidentiality of their customers. Even if it was a third party that they all use, like CETA, uh, that was um, uh, breached. Uh, so let's see, Malaysian Air and Singapore Airlines have already made headlines in recent days after alerting their customers that they were compromised prior to the attack. I think Air New Zealand was included, Lufthansa, Thai Airlines, and a couple of others. Uh, Finnair, I think, as well. Um, let's see, Singapore Airlines reported more than 580,000 impacted customers alone. Uh, frequent flyer data was compromised. What else? Um, does include some personal data. Yes, of course. Um, airline members of the Star Alliance, including Lufthansa, New Zealand Air, Singapore Air, One World customers, Cathay Pacific, Finnair, Japan Airlines, and Malaysia have started communicating with its at-risk users. Um, I don't know if they said how much data was compromised, did they? No, I'm not seeing any numbers. I mean, this means it's more than 580 because it's just Singapore that had 580. Uh, the airline members, blah, 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 third party and not Malaysia airline computer systems, the systems are linked, frequent flyer benefits, um, was holding data of airlines that are not its direct customers, but are alliance members. Um, obligation to recognize the frequent flyer status, blah, blah, blah. It's common practice for alliance members to recognize the frequent flyer scheme tiers that mandates the sharing of frequent flyer data, airline supply chain attacks on the rise. While details on how the attack happened um, are scant, HackerOne Solutions architect Shlomi Libero said CETA's trove of personal data would be tantalizing. It's not clear what the attack vector was in this breach, but HackerOne vulnerability data shows that the aviation and aerospace industry see more privilege escalation and SQL injection vulnerabilities than any other industry, accounting for 57% of vulnerabilities reported um, to these companies by ethical hackers. Uh, so that's why hacker one would know because they're paying the people that are doing the ethical hacking. Uh, they're like a, you know, a clearing house for, for individuals to, to do um, contracts to find uh, bugs uh, and uh, security vulnerabilities usually in business logic flow, right? Not just things that you can scan and find out about by um, looking at the headers, you know, like security scorecard does or by vulnerability management tools, like we had mentioned that scan uh, through authenticated scans. Uh, but on top of that, you usually do like a bug bounty program and pay for someone from HackerOne. I've heard that some of the best people in HackerOne earn a six figure income um, from uh, their bug bounties. So it's a significant, uh, um, you know, chunk of work and exciting, cool stuff. Because like I said, it's focused a lot on business logic flaws. So if you have a workflow that has multiple stages, like for example, you know, applying for a credit card is not something you just click, you know, one thing and then it's done. Uh, they like to make it look that way, but there's a lot of process on the back end that can be exploited and uh, threat modeled. Uh, let's see, Libro said it's time for airlines to dig in on securing their systems. 
uh, lock down the software supply chain, you know, VA tools like security scorecard to the rescue. Um, let's see, global zero day attacks on users, uh, Excelium file transfer of clients. What else is in this article? Um, you simply cannot know whether your third parties meet your company's security controls until you've completed a full security assessment on them. Uh, that's not exactly true because our platform provides that insight uh, uh, on top of uh, assessments because assessments are often just att attestation of someone saying yes or no to a question and they could be wrong or they could be lying or they could make you know creative truths uh, when they answer the questions uh, so anyway i think uh basically our business model will be you know doing quite well given the fact that these events keep happening uh, and we're here to help. Um, we give lots of people platform access for free, for example. Uh, let's see, so we have a few more minutes left. This was Sita. I wonder if Twitter has anything to say about it. Um, Cause like I said, Twitter is a great source of information. So if we look for Sita breach and you can search for top and latest, right? So this is the top story, meaning lots of people looking at it. Uh, latest oftentimes gives you a better insight into uh, someone saying, you know, oh, they know what the, the vector of attack was. Uh, so let's see, one mile at a time, seat the responsible for new airline breach. Um, Scurio comment on IT operator, CETA's breach. Uh, this one might have some interesting detail. Oh, here's an actual letter. Um, uh, let's see if this one comes up. Uh, Dear American Airlines, 2010s calls and it wants your client database back. It seems like everyone else already has it. Uh, let's see, here's the letter. Um, hello, Marcus Lampinen. We're informing you of a recent event that may have involved a limited amount of your advanced information. American Airlines was recently notified by CETA that um, suffered a data security incident involving a limited number of royalty loyalty data. Uh, residing on their passenger service system, PSS. Importantly, the incident did not result in the compromise of an account, passwords, or financial information. American systems were not involved in this incident. So they're disavowing their own responsibility, but they will still be sued and levied with the GDPR um, fines for that. Um, what more can better tell us? Um, a mile at a time story. Uh, business traveler news. Um, how is this not another sign we need to mainstream ZK proof tech ASAP? Um, let's see, millions of travelers from major airlines. Bleeping computer story might be interesting. Um, I mean, I imagine they just probably calculated how many you know airline loyalty members there are and assumed that they were all hit. The total number of travelers impacted is remains unclear, but the figure is over 2.1 million, with most of them being participants in Lufthansa's group of miles. Okay. And let's see, Star Alliance, One World Airlines affected. Uh, Lufthansa with its combined subsidiaries. I wonder where they got the 2.1 million number from. Um, I'm guessing it's from some type of CETA publication that says how many customer data is. I imagine they didn't lose part of the database. My guess is they lost all of the database in the breach. Um, because the hackers breached the reservation system of the, of the undisclosed Asian airline that is also a Star Alliance member, customer data from miles and more is also impacted by the incident. About 1.3 million participants in the program having the frequent flyer status, Lufthansa said. Um, Stolen information refers to the service card number, status level, and in some cases, the name of the participant. Hmm. Well, let's consider personal data. Um, and see what else. Uh, this looks like someone else's um, posting of the Finair information. We were informed of the breach over the weekend. Based on analysis of the breach data, the information we received from CETA, we believe the risk of this data being misused is relatively low. However, as a standard precaution, we, rem uh, we recommend you reset your Finair Plus password. Um, YLE reports about 200,000 members of these people were affected. Okay, um, time for probably one more story. And, but let's just see if there's any fresh news on this in here to talk about the attack vector. <coughs> Looks like it's just the initial wave of stories that are all 
posting um, someone that might know something about PSS servers um, probably would post more information here uh, and provide more details. Millions. This one, uh, yeah, millions of travelers, you know, Singapore Airlines, what else? Anyway, so as the time rolls forward, um, you'll start to probably see more knowledge, you know, percolating up as to, you know, how, what was the attack vector? Um, but I'm guessing it was a phishing attack, right? Because 92% uh, of all breaches are started with a phishing attack. And lack of endpoint protection, you know, could well have been um, a phishing attack triggered through the, well, when did they say the date was actually? Um, I wonder where the date was. Uh, Security week. Let's look at their story real quick. Um, blah, blah, blah. They said on Thursday. Okay. Um, oh, let's see. The event was in February. Uh, let's read their statement real quick. See the statement about security incident. See to confirm that the attack that it was a victim of cyber attack, leading to a data security incident involving certain passenger data stored on the PSS. Um, after confirmation of the seriousness of the incident on Feb 24, they took immediate action. We recognize his rate and concern, see that acted swiftly, remains continued investigation with their incident response team and the support of a leading external experts in cybersecurity. So that's probably Dell SecureWorks, CrowdStrike, or um, FireEye, right? Or there could be others, but those are the usual suspects. <clears throat> if you're a customer of an airline and have a data subject access request in relation to the handling of your personal data, it must be made directly to the airline in accordance with GDPR. So I can imagine a lot of people will be filing GDPR data subject rights requests. Uh, so that's time to end the share and uh, finish the lecture for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed my scenic sunset uh, from Governor's Island behind me and uh, the Statue of Liberty over in the corner and these glamping tents that they have. Um, I was there a couple of years ago uh, to celebrate my daughter's birthday and it was a great place to uh, enjoy uh, some camping and uh, bicycling around Governor's Island and overnight. All right, so I'm gonna hit stop and uh, I'll see you in the Slack channels, but thanks for joining uh, the lecture, those of you that were here uh, for it in real time. And um, let's see, yeah, United Airlines names, frequent flyer levels, uh, blah, blah, blah. Yep, all right. So we'll see you next week. Thanks again.